science. We get experimental yes. science. We're curious, non judgmental. For those coming on in tonight, we're going to have a special crossover stream with Danny uh, of Paleontologizing, where they're going to be talking fossil science from a geneticist's point of view, as well as from the paleontologist's view. And then we're going to reverse it. We're going to talk genetics from a paleontology point of view and the geneticist's view. And we're going to dissect papers together and talk about the science behind them and see how our fields would interpret the data differently and what that ends up meaning, which I think is going to be really fun. Because I, I don't know if anyone's done that kind of crossover before. So let's... But so, yeah, we were y'all. Yeah. We had talked about with Danny that we were gonna start chatters. My favorite part was that when Danny and I came up with these papers, I'd actually sent him some. He's like, "These are the ones I had also picked out." <laughs> so we're like, "Okay, we're <laughs> exactly. on that." Exactly. I was really happy about that. Yeah, yeah. And some of these topics actually came up today in discussion too. So I was really excited about that. Talking about um, predation from theropod dinosaurs on sauropods and the Morrison Formation and stuff. So. And yeah. also, just it yeah. was interesting today. Uh, Cliff came in here too and was talking about how it, we were we were finding out that if we stopped eating meat, we'd end up on four legs. <laughs> After like you know thousands of generations, possibly. Yeah, yeah. It was, but, uh, but it's yeah, it's a good enough. memory, a way to remember it, right? It's something that you don't, I mean, yeah. or at least I don't actively think about how diet affects body formation and your evolutionary lineage. But I, it was just such a neat example yeah. of like. They're giant. Mm -hmm. Oh, we said, all right, di I think it dinosaurs have won. First paper is a dinosaur. Oh, wow, paper. okay. Well, well, well. Um, Yeah, do you want to maybe pick the, the tooth one first? I don't know. Wait, so um, and we can talk about that. Do we want the, let's see, the carnivorous one? The Pier J paper? Mm -hmm. You got it. Let's do the Pier J one, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So anyway, just to kind of like outline this for everybody watching, Valent and I had this idea to do, you know, like a crossover about once a week. So we're trying that out right now. Um, I know sometimes I, uh, I don't have as many opportunities as I would like to talk about scientific papers with my colleagues, with fellow scientists. And so this is kind of scratching that itch. And we thought it would be a really cool thing to, to be able to, to show here on stream as well. I think it's important to show, you know, two scientists kind of like shooting the stuff, <laughs> just talking casually about science, and it's going to be fun. And I I hope everybody enjoys this. So, yeah. and what I think makes it unique too is our backgrounds and trainings are so different. That yes, I, yeah. I what I, I I'm really excited about what questions you're going to have of like, well, I'm not convinced by this study because of X, Y, and Z. Sure, and vice versa, yeah. 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 And I think it'll also be cool just to see, even though we come from very disparate fields, and we might not have, like, there might be kind of language barriers here in terms of our different scientific fields, there's still going to be a lot of overlap in terms of the concepts. And I think and, that further uh, highlights some of the of issues, of like, of it, how difficult it is for sometimes... We've talked about how non-scientist is difficult, because you look at a paper title... And it feels yeah. like a, a Harry Potter mystery title of like, I don't, Harry Potter <laughs> and then like 40 words that make no sense. Right. Uh -huh. And that's, that's true in our At least favorite of the Harry Potter books. <laughs> yeah. but that's, that's true between our field, like between science too, of like, you know, I'm not sure yeah. what this term means. And it's like, we're going to try to break down the gate, some of the gatekeeping here. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. Uh. All right, so this is our first paper, y'all. So bite and tooth marks on sauropod dinosaurs from the Morris information. Um, so Danny, yeah. just if you wouldn't mind, I know this is quite basic for if we have some maybe folks who don't know you yet might not uh -huh. know what a sauropod is. What is a sauropod dinosaur? Yeah, yeah. So a sauropod dinosaur is one of the long-necked plant-eating dinosaurs. So think of like, uh, I don't know, Diplodocus, Brachiosaurus, Dino from the Flintstones, or the Sinclair oil logo. Um, yeah, yeah. Sauropods are the long-necked, four-legged plant eaters. They're the biggest animals to ever walk the Earth, and uh, they were all over North America in the late Jurassic period. That's what the Morrison Formation is. Was the Morrison Formation is the set of rocks 
it's probably about seven million years, give or take a few million years, at the end of the Jurassic period. That's where some of your favorite dinosaurs might be from. That's where Apatosaurus, a.k.a. Brontosaurus, Diplodocus, Stegosaurus, that we were talking about yesterday on my stream, uh, Camarasaurus, Ceratosaurus, Allosaurus, they're all from the Morrison Formation. Now, so Tyrannosaurus like too, right? What's that? Is Tyrannosaurus also in there? No. No, Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops and Pachycephalosaurus, those dinosaurs are from the Hell Creek Formation. So they're from about 70 million years later. So, so that's the thing is that... Yeah, yeah, go the, ahead. The, no, the reason I ask is because I read some popular media on this article. And they uh -huh. said that it was interesting that it was they did not have Tyrannosaur uh, imprints on these animals. And we're even making it a highlight of that. And so I, I wanted to... In reading the That's paper, weird. I didn't I didn't get that feeling that there was any mention of it. Yeah. But again, it's not my expertise, so it's it's interesting that there's this difference in. Uh, I mean, we've I'm sure we, you've talked about it too, like how the popular media reports, and because you, you even said like your favorite dinos, I'm like, oh, th this paper said. Right. So they may have made a goof in uh, in writing the the, like, you know how when you write a press release. Sometimes the university or whoever they might screw things up a little bit before they publish it. Um, you write this really carefully crafted press release, and it gets all mucked up, and uh, that may have been what happened there. Yeah, yeah. that fair, fair. Yeah, because yeah. again, in the paper, I, I'm like, I see no mention of T Rex in this paper, but there had been in the, yeah. the popular media. Okay, so, so that's that's cool. So, yeah, T Rex, Tyrannosaurus Rex, is closer in time to you and me than it is to the Morrison Formation or any of the dinosaurs that are described here. So again, a yeah. lot of the popular media movies are going to be very misleading yeah. on that front. Like, Stegosaurus fighting sure. a T-Rex is not really something we're going to see. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those dinosaurs are separated by like 70 million years, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So yeah, which, which is there a figure that you would like us to start on? What is... How should we do this? Yeah, I don't know. I think maybe just any questions that you had about it. Like this is this is fun so far. I'm I'm, I'm enjoying this. Just like kind of giving background on it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um. So these are some of the bite marks that they gave. So and I thought it was really nice that they did like 3D modeling of it as well. So they yeah. did like this this scanning back and you know taking a look and seeing what the structures are going to look like and what the imprints are. Uh huh. What I'm always wondering of is they see the, the imprints, and so how do you know, as a scientist, that, of what exactly is causing these imprints, right? Like, how, how do you make, it almost seems like it could, and I know it's not, but it could be a logical jump of going from this bite mark feel mm -hmm. to them being that being a carnivore, and that being a carnivore of a particular age. Yep, that's a, that's a great point, and that's something that, these authors, I, I feel like they're pretty good about um, avoiding some of these pitfalls. So anytime you find scratches on a dinosaur fossil like this, you have to rule out a few things. You've got to make sure that these didn't happen from whoever was digging it up in the field, that they didn't just scratch it up by mistake. So you've got to make sure that those are actual ancient marks on the bone. And then beyond that, you can look really, really carefully at the, the structure of these indentations, of these scratch marks. And I think they did a pretty good job here of demonstrating that these are from uh, from theropod dinosaurs. So theropods are the two-legged meat-eating dinosaurs. There's other animals in that environment that also have sharp teeth that might have been chewing on bones like this. Things like crocodiles. But these don't look like crocodile bite marks. We've got crocodiles around today, and we can look at the bite marks that they leave on bones. And they look very different from a lot of these. These are like... They're narrow and they're deep. They almost look like from a steak knife or something like that. So they're clearly from dinosaurs that have got what we call xiphodont teeth. They've got teeth that are narrow from side to side and they've got serrations like a steak knife. Okay. Crocodiles, on the other hand, have teeth that are more like, they're more cone shaped. Um, and so they don't have those like keeled serrations on them. I believe they like, had a figure uh, on like that too. Like theropod dinosaur teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think go. they did have a figure. So That's I, beautiful. These, I love this figure. Yeah. So, it, are we looking for do you, these had serrations then at some point? Yep, all of those have serrations. They're very small on 
on these guys. Mm -hmm. So if you look at like a T-Rex tooth, it's going to have really, really large serrations on it. They're like visible to the naked eye. Mm -hmm. These guys, the, the teeth on like Allosaurus, Torvosaurus, Ceratosaurus, etc. They're going to have smaller serrations, but uh, you'll still be able to pick those out if you look really closely at the, the score marks from the teeth on the bones. Gotcha. Yeah. So is it... Why don't they just get scratched away? Like, during, like, you know, the fossilization uh -huh. process, like, or erosion and kind of, like, do yep. we predict that they were more serrated? And that's, like, that's what you, like, or do you extrapolate into seeing what's in the bone? Or... Yeah, it, it's more like uh, so those those scratch marks they are into the surface of the bones. Mm -hmm. They might be like a few millimeters deep. Like these are some serious scratch marks on the bone right there. But when these bones get fossilized, as long as they're preserved really well, like with a high level of detail, they'll still be there. Wow. Okay. If a fossil is like not well preserved, if it's like all kind of scrunched up during the fossilization process, you're not going to be able to see that level of detail. But a lot of the bones that come from the Morrison Formation are exquisitely well-preserved. Mm -hmm. Like, really, really fine detail there on the surface. And even internal structure, too. So the internal structure of these dinosaurs' bones, all the growth rings and stuff inside, okay. will still be there if they're cool. well-preserved. Yeah. And that's pretty typical. Like, it's... I've dug up a lot of bones in the past that have been poorly preserved, and oftentimes you just leave those ones in the field because it's like, we're not going to be able to gather a lot of data on these. Um, you want well-preserved bones. Yeah. So that, I think, just brings up an interesting tangent of how do you know what uh -huh. data is good data, right? So I know we have this issue in biology as well, like like when you're actively yeah. working with a living organism of how you know and can recognize what something is not the right, like, like this is replicate hasn't gone right, it's not representative of the data, and so we're going to remove it from the experimental pool versus right like and same with this right like when you're you're filtering for a good fossil like i think it's all it's it's a uh -huh. similar idea is going at place like for us if we're going through the biological data and we're trying to re what's the the replicate it's not necessarily there's an outlier because there might be an outlier and that's the real data but it could be sure. something actually went wrong that day in the experiment so how do you uh -huh. when you're getting rid of not rid of but like not digging up a particular fossil is that ever a concern it is like we call that sampling bias mm -hmm. in in paleontology like only collecting certain specimens and in this case the specimens that they were looking at um there were a lot in the museum like in different museums and then there were a lot of bite marks that had already been published in other papers so this is almost like a meta study in that sense yeah where they just wanted to do kind of a survey of like different bite marks from theropod dinosaurs from the morrison formation and so they in terms of like which data would be outliers and which are more you know I, this this is more of like a survey i guess and i feel like they were pretty careful about uh what conclusions they could draw from this there's no they're not saying that they can pick out which bite marks came from a which kind of theropod dinosaur in this paper so like you look at that figure and you've got a bunch of different theropods there um at different sizes and they're pretty clear in the paper like We've got a bunch of bite marks here, and we don't know which of these are from which of these different theropods, which are from Allosaurus, which are from Torbosaurus, which are from Ceratosaurus. Um, so yeah, they're they're pretty realistic about that. They're pretty humble about those. Conclusions. That was gonna be my which next which is something I like. This is like the preliminary preliminary stuff here. Yeah, it's yeah. Like that, bite that marks be my have not been like, studied that well yet. Like, how does that make yeah. you feel? That it's uh -huh. you know that you like you don't know those things because I know for us. Uh -huh. Like if it was like, well, what does this gene talk to? Like yeah. you, you wouldn't get that paper published then, right? With like that that amount of knowledge, and so it's just like what the thresholds are for uh -huh. getting, um, like what's the appropriate for being notable of enough to be publishable. Yeah, yeah, and like what yeah. for you, yeah. you personally, like, are you satisfied with the amount of data that was in here to make said conclusion, or you feel like this is maybe a little too preliminary? Uh, I don't know. I, I personally, I'm much more on the side of like, let's publish every observation. And like, you know, I think the barrier to publication is oftentimes too high. Yep. Um, I, I think it's really cool that a lot of this stuff is getting published. Um, 
This, I think, is really exciting because nobody's really looked in detail at bite marks in theropod dinosaurs from the Morrison Formation before, so this is like a good baseline kind of study. It's like, yes, you can get a paper published on this, and there's some interesting information in here. We definitely don't know everything yet, but it's really cool that we can know anything at all about the carnivorous habits of these animals that died out 145 million years ago. You know, that's that's extraordinary that we can know anything at all about this. Yeah. It's, I mean, I think, you know, Mur Murph yeah, says ahead. it well, that it feel like paleontology is almost feeding off scraps in a certain way where it's like you, you're 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 so handicapped to start yeah. because the animal is gone and you're dependent on finding these fossils. And so it's just I think it's important to keep that in mind. Then when we're talking about the paper, and that's just why I'm curious of like, well, how do For you sure. know? that when a paper is ready because for i don't know it's, it's always like well there's always one more experiment i'm sure there's always one more sample you could dig up but that's like uh -huh. you know where you're convinced that this is in fact a thing and i know we've talked about on your stream like you you're also uh -huh. so like not always like oh well this new dinosaur that has like one pelvis bone and that's all there uh -huh. is to this definition of this dinosaur right so you're also uh -huh. a skeptic in that sense so it's like what what made you get past that skepticism for this study? Where it's like you can accept I the think, ecological relevance of it, I guess. Grow the fuck up. Yeah, You're not I, children I think anymore. Their, I didn't mind explaining photosynthesis to you when you were 12. Or anything. But you're adults now, and this is an actual crisis. The idea is basically... Oh, we got it. Okay. <laughs> um, Low Mountain was being a little naughty. No worries, no worries. Yeah. <laughs> the idea is like, well... I, I don't feel like their conclusions are too lofty or anything like that it's like we've got bite marks from theropod dinosaurs from the morrison formation and that's really cool here's what we can tell about them so far and here's what we don't know it's kind of like outlining a baseline like you know this is what we can figure out and here's all the things that are still mysteries and i think those kinds of papers are really important there yeah um, and i mean that's for, that i when, really like that about the paper that it did have that yeah. air of this isn't the definitive study, but I, yep. to me, I, that's why I was wondering your perspective on if you were then convinced, because it was almost like, was it, I, this is, is again, maybe a field difference in biology. They'd say this is being too honest of like, weird of, okay. of, of in the sense of like, you know, <laughs> he, here's how, here's how much we can actually garner from this. And here's how much more there is. It's almost like they're selling themselves uh -huh. short in a way. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I know in with this particular paper, um, the bite marks from dinosaurs from the Morrison formation from like allosaurs and stuff like that have been really understudied. Um, and they've not been. I, I think this is the first paper of its kind for this age of, of dinosaurs from the Morrison formation like this. We've got publications on bite marks from tyrannosaurs from the latest Cretaceous period and stuff. And so those are really well known. And we can do things like tell how Tyrannosaurs were feeding on Triceratops and stuff like that based on the bite marks. And so this is kind of like expanding that out to uh, to dinosaurs like Allosauroids and Ceratosaurs and stuff from much earlier in time. So it's, it's kind of expanding the field in that sense. But like you said, it is really honest about like, this is what we know and this is what we don't. But um, I think it's important to like kind of broaden that out to critters like allosaurus i'm tempted to grab my allosaurus 3d printed skull right there so i can show that to the camera and show you what i'm talking about here in terms of their teeth can i do that real quick yeah absolutely absolutely all right cool let me grab that and i hope this will this will help illustrate a point here and uh nerdowino welcome in professor and how are you doing guys make sure to check out nerdowino who is also on the science panel with us at twitchcon nasa scientist extraordinaire yeah. whoa danny I forget how, how you large doing, that is. It's good to see you. It's so, yeah. yeah, it's awesome. So this is Allosaurus right here. 3D printed Allosaurus skull. It's a pretty large one for Allosaurus. But its teeth are a lot smaller than that of a Tyrannosaur. And they're more narrow from side to side. Um, Tyrannosaurus, they had teeth that were adapted for, like, crushing bone. They had really, really thick teeth. Um... They're, they're very wide in cross-section. Sometimes they're referred to as, like, you know, uh, killer railroad spikes or killer bananas. 
And Allosaurus teeth, on the other hand, are much narrower from side to side. So we don't think of these dinosaurs as being able to, like, crush bone or anything with their teeth. But some paleontologists before had published on, like, in talking about Allosaurus, they've said, oh, yeah, these guys, they had their teeth were too delicate. They wouldn't have even left tooth marks. They're, they're like, actively avoiding contacting the bone with their teeth. And this new paper shows that that's not the case. So it's like, it's kind of opening up a new field of study in that sense. Like, these guys did leave tooth marks. They're not as common as in Tyrannosaurus, but we do have tooth marks from these critters now, and, and that's kind of exciting. It's a new thing that we can look at to try and get some more information about how these animals were feeding. So yeah. given the skepticism in the field, like you were describing before this paper, yeah. are you convinced by the data of the, the scratches in the bone that it is in fact an allosaurus mm -hmm. tooth that's doing the scratching I think here, let, let me go put this down because yeah. this is really heavy and my arm's getting tired but <laughs> but yeah I am, I'm pretty convinced I'll, I'll tell you why in a second hang on a second alright yeah um, so in the paper they they don't claim that they can tell that the tooth marks are either from an Allosaurus or from, say, a Torvosaurus or Ceratosaurus. They leave some hints there where we think that this might be this or that, but they're very tentative about it, which I appreciate. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think it's it's cool that they're just asking these questions in the first place. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah. This is this is totally a new field. Like this is a new avenue of inquiry and talking about about dinosaurs of this time period and uh i think that's really exciting that somebody has actually decided to look at these and do like kind of a general survey try and lay the groundwork for future studies here. That yeah sense? that's it, no it, it's it's super cool i like the the undertones of what they suspect it might be right but it's it's just interesting when you come up against that like you're describing that these teeth were suspected that they couldn't do these things uh, I guess right. we had a, there was a question in the chat too from Sparky about is uh -huh. there any way to almost simulate what this teeth could have done in the modern era? So like, presumably yeah. you can't take the fossilized tooth and scratch a bone, right? And try to replicate that scratch, but is there can Not you... with the fossil tooth, no, but yeah, but you can create models like this, and that's actually been done before. There was a, a video clip I showed a while ago with an acrocanthosaurus tooth um, and it, like you can never get the exact materials right or anything, but they tried to like roughly approximate this is how strong the tooth would be, and then this is how strong the armor plate of one of these armored dinosaurs would be. And they tried to figure out if that tooth could actually penetrate the armor plate using like a scale model. And those sorts of things can be, uh, they can kind of put you on the right track for thinking about a problem, but they can never demonstrate like, yes, this dinosaur 100% could do this or couldn't do that because you can never get those materials exactly you know on par with the real thing yeah i have to tell you this is still so surreal to me that you and i are chatting about this this is so much fun <laughs> i'm having a great time because it's i don't know y'all i, Good, like, I read glad. scientific papers right and i have so many questions and like i never want to yeah. hog danny's chat as well when he's live because i'm like I, i'm like these are just absurd number of questions but it's just so cool uh -huh. to be able to chat it out with the the expert in the field about like what you this know, is a ton of fun, question. yeah. Yeah. Like so like with what you were saying with the models, like in our field what we would do is it it sounds almost like atomic force microscopy, where you would put a cell huh. underneath a microscope and essentially put pressure onto it and, and measure the the tensile strength of a structure. And so we were looking at actually in grad school at a nucleus. And so you can see how oh. much pressure the nucleus can take before the cell lyses. And so then you can oh, try to model wow. that once you have the numbers and say like how much strain, because we were looking at it as um, as these cells are undergoing uh, division, they can become uh -huh. multinucleated and how the cells, when they're pulling away from one another, like how much force there needs to be to not become like a new cell, but stay multiply nucleated. And so you can simulate that with the, the microscope. So it's, I guess it's that it's the huh. equivalent we're trying to simulate with a model of like forces that can take into. When you say multinucleated, do you mean that the nucleus splits, or there's a... I'm, I'm picturing multiple nuclei here. Yep. So, it, it turns huh. out, and this isn't just in, in flies, but an old fruit fly, their brain uh -huh. will have fewer cells, 
but the cells that are there are bigger and they have multiple full nuclei that have the entire genome in each nucleus like a regular nucleus and that's a symptom of, of old patients as well human patients also if you huh. do cross sections you'll have multi-nucleated cells and it's a sign of a, an aging brain and you know what why and it why that is you know is still unknown but even um there's an aging huh. d- disease called progeria and it's if you uh-huh. look at human patients right like a six-year-old kid looks like physically and biologically like they're 80 and if you look at their brain slices their brains where they have those Uh big cells just like the 80 year old man except they're six seven and eight jeez wow i would imagine that would have have all kinds of like physical and mental maladies that would come with that when but what's crazy is like the kids you know like there's no a lot of these you know aging disorders are also associated with mental La- like uh-huh. regression but they're like on point smart kids and they're so sweet huh. but it's just they're just have this up until age two they're totally normal and then they just get accelerated aging like almost a reverse benjamin button if you will wow i think the oldest awesome. patient was 14 before they passed because of that and so oh wow yeah like you could but you yeah. can model the uh-huh. the aging of the cells using that that tensile strength of the the nucleus and so it just reminded me of how you were saying with wow. the modeling of the teeth as uh-huh. well interesting stuff yeah yeah it, it's it's tough in in dinosaur paleontology since we don't have living animals that we can run experiments on you know in terms of non-avian dinosaurs um we got to come up with pretty creative ways to try to test some of these ideas and I, it, uh that's yeah, like the yeah. most that's where i always get hung up too on not just like the dinosaur papers right but also if you're working in an organism that doesn't yet have genetics even if you have the living organism right you can't test that question i'm always like but 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 you know (laughs) there's that little (laughs) point because like for me and murph asked you know if you and i could provide like an example of what papers we generally would look at in the fields but for me it's Uh this idea of a, a car mechanic breaking the car and putting it back together and so what you do is you test if a gene is necessary by breaking it mm-hmm. and then you see if it's sufficient by putting it into something that maybe ha- doesn't have it or by turning it on really high and if so it's that'd be an know, example of a genetics paper that like that's how it normally goes that's like the general plot for a genetics paper is like yeah it's like we get rid of it okay there's okay. something i uh-huh. put it into something that didn't have it and it replicates like normal behavior from the original animal or if i turn it up it accentuates the phenotype so it's like sure you're, you're really getting down to the nitty-gritty like this gene proves this one thing on both ends and uh-huh. it's it's always like if you can't prove it both directions then it always brings into question it's like well is it really that gene or is it an off-target effect right. of a different gene and so like uh-huh i'm always taken by like how these papers and like whenever you talk about it on stream it's like wow that's that totally makes logical sense right of like how that could work but but how do you keep out from another 30 different hypotheses right like just like with the allosaurus tooth uh uh-huh like yeah i I think if i were to have to come up with a, a like general plot line for how dinosaur paleontology papers go I mean, there's lots and lots of different ways to study dinosaurs, and so we've got a lot of like different genres of dinosaur papers. But maybe the most basic or most common one might be akin to like a uh, crime scene investigation or something like that, like trying to serve a, a murder, solve a murder mystery, where it's like, you know, we've got limited information at the scene of the crime. Let's try and figure out what happened here based on what's there, based on what's left, um, where it's like. You know, this is, there's teeth surrounding the skeleton right here. It's like this is preyed upon by another animal. I guess this analogy doesn't work super well because oftentimes it's just like we've got limited parts of an animal here and we're trying to figure out what it was, what it's related to, what its biology was, you know, that kind of thing. But maybe think of it in terms of like crime scene investigation, maybe, if that analogy isn't too overplayed. No, yeah. no, it makes it's. I just I imagine it's frustrating too because you can't get the DNA and you can't do the sequencing and because 
one we thing. We don't even think can... about DNA. Yeah, you know, yeah, DNA, can't, is, can't even think of <laughs> DNA is, is doesn't even it never occurs to us. It's like DNA is such a fragile thing. It's like that's you know, I, it only lasts a few thousand years or something, and then it's gone. Um, and see, for us, so it's, yeah, it's RNA. It's such a fleeting thing. For us, it's yeah, RNA okay. that lasts twenty minutes. Like. If there you, you go. If you look at RNA the wrong way, yeah. it breaks. Uh huh. Um, like there's yeah. like on your yeah. skin, there's these things called RNAs, right? That eat up RNA and break mm -hmm. it down because that's how viruses replicate. And so when you do a, huh. an RNA extraction at your lab bench, you have to wipe it down with this thing called RNA zap that gets rid of RNAs and everything's sterile. And if you blink uh -huh. at the wrong thing, it just dies, and it, the RNA is gone. <laughs> and so I imagine yep. it's kind of like y'all too. With like, it's a pipe dream to have that DNA because my ideal experiment, right, with what you, with when the paleontology field is, you know, this is in the the imaginative universe. I got the sequence, mm -hmm. and the, you know, uh -huh. let's say we find like the tooth size or serrations, right? And then we have a predictive uh -huh. metric of like, okay, we think it's this gene. I'm going to put it into the chicken and then see if it makes right. serrated teeth. And then you've proven, okay, this was that <laughs> lineage. And then maybe you see like, the, yeah, right. So that's where I spiral. I'm like, oh man, it's so difficult to catch up on that. Uh huh. I think, I think we'll get into this a little bit with the, the second paper that I have selected with the pachycephalosaurs. Okay. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, just some foreshadowing here. Yeah. But we we don't have dna for dinosaurs we don't even like you talk about having a sequence like we don't have a single base pair of, am i if i'm even saying that correctly of any non-avian dinosaur like that just those data do not exist so if you're trying to figure out if a dinosaur is related to another dinosaur you have to do that via morphology it's just based on the shape of the fossils and it usually we've got extremely incomplete fossils sometimes even just a single bone and you're trying to figure out what this animal was like and who it's related to based on like a fragment of a single bone but oftentimes we're able to do that which which you'll see in the other paper which is yeah. amazing by the way that that's even possible because I, I don't i feel like it's a basic question like what is this animal i mean it's not like we're we're figuring out anything <laughs> extraordinarily specific about its biology or anything but it is pretty cool that we can tell anything at all about these critters that died out tens of millions of years ago that no one's ever seen in the flesh you know well i feel like yeah. the other fields have almost swung in the other direction where this art of morphological characterization has almost gone away and it's like an over dependence on the genetic side of things which i'm not oh, yeah. pooing the genetic side but it's almost like the morphology is still really important so I, definitely and that's the thing where um morphology is a lost art um in in other fields like sometimes um archaeologists who are not paleontologists as we all know um sometimes they'll find like an animal skeleton in a dig and they have like you know they've got no idea what kind of animal this is and it's like are you going to call up a herpetologist or a mammologist or an ornithologist to look at the bones somebody who studies you know reptiles and amphibians or mammals or birds those scientists don't know the bones who do you call you call a paleontologist we're like the only scientists who still look at bones really and so sometimes we're in high demand like that from people from other fields when all they've got is bones but who do you call the bone specialists paleontologists so yeah i didn't yeah. so i didn't pick this paper this week but if mm -hmm. we do this again and i hope we do we because chat we talked okay, about maybe yeah. making this like even weekly if danny's up to it um is there's Sounds a great. paper that was demonstrating that they thought they found chromosomal structures of dinosaurs uh that were preserved oh, and what was this this was a few years ago i think it's like a 2020 or 2019 paper i'll i'll, I'll refine it but i think i might i think i might know one of the authors actually it might be alita bayul was one of the awesome, I think I, I think I remember this one. Okay, yeah. so yeah. because and that's like getting into almost the possibility of recovering something in terms of the genetics, like not necessarily sequence, but even chromosome structure. Uh -huh. And so I, I do want to pick your brain on that paper because that's a really, I think almost bringing our, it, our two fields together flavor of paper. I like this idea. I like that a lot. We should we should talk about that next time, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, but yeah, so I, I totally squirreled this on a rabbit hole. I apologize. Um, no, this is great. This is what we're here for. Yeah. But yeah, this, I thought, you know, the paper, like we said, was, I thought the figures were really well done. Uh, I really liked uh -huh. the imaging that they put forth of even like the teeth structures and like where things would land. I thought that was yeah, yeah. a very elegant prediction of how the bite force would act by based on like where all these mandibles are located um Tooth what placement. is yeah it's what we've got you know we don't have a whole lot else so you got to run with that <laughs> did, you, did you feel like that was appropriately done like the prediction metric definitely like, you know i don't have this the is, expertise this is pretty actually... typical for like bite, bite marks papers this is generally how you do it okay um yeah 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 i mean i they thought did it was really super, well here though yeah it was super super clever even like taking into account like missing teeth and how that would might affect that bite mark and so i thought it felt yep. really thorough and I didn't know how much more they really could have done independent of going in the field and getting a bunch more samples. But like you were mm -hmm. saying, and I guess I didn't appreciate how rare the samples actually are that have these bite marks. Yeah. And so, For sure. so especially it, in the Morrison formation, like allosaurs and these other dinosaurs, ceratosaurs and torbosaurs, they haven't got the big bone crushing teeth like tyrannosaurs. They were like probably actively trying to not scrape their teeth on the bones of their prey as often so there's just fewer bite marks there to, to sample so presumably yeah. it was more like flesh ripping <laughs> right rather yeah. than that's biting think, on yeah. the bone yeah. is there from a hunting perspective any benefit any like beneficial difference between the two is it one is just you take out your prey faster and then you can eat it or it, it's that doesn't really even come into it like hunting um because it's we can't tell if if those prey items were already dead when the theropod dinosaurs were snacking on them or whether they killed them first the only way that you can tell if like an animal had been bitten and you know during its lifetime is if that animal lived to tell the tale if that bite mark healed later then you can tell that oh yeah this happened during the animal's lifetime but if you have an allosaurus attack a diplodocus and it kills it and then starts eating it you wouldn't be able to tell if that allosaurus killed it or whether it just stumbled upon a dead diplodocus and started eating it because uh -huh. there's no hope of having healed bite marks there if that makes sense gotcha so in terms yeah. of hunting strategy we're kind of in the dark there yeah uh-huh Okay. It is interesting in that um, they did say in the paper that uh, that it was it seemed like the bones of smaller sauropod dinosaurs, the smaller long neck dinosaurs, um, had more bite marks, and like that might be more indicative of like dinosaurs like Allosaurus were preying on the small ones selectively, which would make a lot of sense because that. Um, one of the ideas that we have is that sauropods got so very, very large because of predation pressure. So, like, this is a defense. Getting so very large would have helped them to avoid getting killed by these predators. And so if you're finding, like, bite marks selectively on the small ones, maybe it shows that there's, like, act, like there's more active predation pressure on the small ones than the large ones. Um right versus yeah. if you didn't find any bite marks on the larger ones maybe they do then have the mm -hmm. protection of being big and they're not going to be preyed on maybe maybe yeah yeah although they would they still got to die at some point and they probably gonna have theropods eating them after they're dead so and then like you said um, it's, it's hard to tell the difference between yeah if they died sure. from being eaten or attacked or if they died from natural causes exactly yeah yeah. yeah i see i never it could be the yeah. No, I yeah, never even conundrums hit my head. left and right bullet. That's how that's how paleontology is. It's <laughs> our our hands are tied in so many different so many different ways, but that's I think part of the joy of our science is like we're lucky we can know anything about this stuff at all. Yeah, yeah. no, I, that's why I love this, like chatting. It's like kind of revealing some of the the scientific uh -huh. logic and thinking behind it and I like hearing the limitations right. because I think it humanizes us as well. It's like we're not perfect in our ivory tires and know all the answers there are things that we can't know not. yet yeah yeah the history of dinosaur paleontology is the history of like making claims and getting them completely wrong and then having researchers decades later demonstrate that and 
Shoot, we were talking about yesterday about Stegosaurus and how when this dinosaur was first discovered, everything we knew about Stegosaurus back then turned out to be completely wrong. <laughs> there were dinosaurs, like, Othniel Charles Marsh was mixing up different parts of different dinosaurs and stuff like that, and it... We're more careful nowadays, but, like, those were lessons that were... I think were learned the hard way back in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Yeah, that that's definitely been appreciated from when I've when we've talked in your stream. Uh, we've got some new people here, first time chatter, Mama M Media, welcome in, and hello, Yogurt Garrel, on your twenty five day uh, viewing nice. streak, Madame, welcome in. Holy cow, very Thank nice, Yogurt Garrel. New feature they're rolling out as your watch streak, and <laughs> she yogurt's on a twenty five. I've stream never watch. seen that before. That's really neat. Yeah, I oh. think they just rolled it out. Yeah, yeah, just yesterday they were rolling it out on. Not everyone yet has it. But very soon, I think that's gotcha. going to be the next thing. Um, so yeah, for those cool. coming on in, we're, we're 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 chatting and shooting the breeze, as Claire Burr said, as we, Danny and I were struggling we for the word um, yeah. about papers, <laughs> and we're dissecting each other's fields papers, <laughs> essentially of like asking yeah. each other questions. And so we're on a, a, a paper now about dinosaur teeth marks and how that might we can predict about their ecology and behavior. Which, you know, I'm always a skeptic on, but I'm getting convinced on this. And then we're going to go over and talk <laughs> about, uh, I, I'm, yeah. I'm sure Danny will give me skepticism on this too, on like uh, rat imagination and things like that. Well, we'll talk about that. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. It, it almost seemed like a no-duh kind of thing to me, but... Um, I think this this outlines some differences in our fields, which I think is and, which which really I cool. think yeah will be really fun to talk about, like what we consider something that needs to be addressed versus something that why would you ever address this? Because yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, and and if yeah. we can even then do the reverse, <laughs> like well, okay, well, could we ask this? And like, if we ask it in a modern day bird, and mm -hmm. almost reverse engineer the hypothesis and say like what would a dinosaur do right that uh -huh. like there's a paper we have tonight too uh, if we get to like on biofluorescence and i'd be curious to yeah. know like what we can think about uh, with dinosaurs because hugan mentioned like melanosomes are rare in dinosaurs but have those samples uh -huh. been put under like different rate uh, types of uh fluorescent light sources to measure if there is any biofluorescence there uh -huh. and yes yeah, it's interesting idea i had a whole different angle with that paper so yeah oh, i'm perfect. excited to get to that yeah 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 um, and then cool. yeah i just wanted to highlight just i like the fact that they put in this paper like zoom ins of different bone structures as well like the looking at like mm -hmm. okay here is like the neural spine as well like also having these bite marks and i got yep. to, i got to thinking now as we're chatting like i wonder if there is a correlation between where the bite marks are located and maybe potential cause of death, like if because it's on a hmm. neur neural cord, I would feel like that might be a harder location to get at for a predator, unless the predator is dead. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like a full-size sauropod like that. And holy cow, we got a raid going. Yeah, we got, yeah, nice. we got a raid from something monstrous. We got a monstrous raid. I stream site. Hello, hello. Hi everybody. How is your stream? Tell us all the things. I promise that I have prescribed you vibes. The vibes we got are giants. Shout out to the stream for the raid. That's science. <laughs> Raiders, come on, welcome on in. Something monstrous. How is your stream? What were y'all just chatting about? We want to know all the things. Was it something scary? Was it something? Oh, from the Harry Horror Show. We know the Harry Horror Show. Welcome on in, y'all. Oh, very oh, nice. Goodness. We've got lots Excellent. of chatters here. We've got a uh, first time chatter, Wadester Law, and Pristine Biscuit. My God, I love your name. Welcome on in. Uh, we've <laughs> got great name. Riot Girl, Synthiap1, James TJV, Big Brain824. I like that name too. Uh, Curvial Sarcastic Ninja, thank you for the follow. Welcome in. You are now all one of us. That's true. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, Curviel, yeah. Pristine Biscuit, everyone, welcome the heck in. Lodoc is a collab between Harry and some monstrous. Nice. What were we all chatting about? What kind of monsters were we all talking about? We actually, a few weeks ago, Harry Horror Show raided over here, and they were talking about um, uh, potential like Loch Ness and other local uh, spooky organisms. Oh, cryptids. And, yes. Yeah. And yeah. I brought up the uh, the Loveland <laughs> Frogman, which is a 
a oh, hybrid yeah. frog uh-huh. human outside of Loveland, Ohio. <laughs> if anyone's interested. <laughs> Oh boy! About yeah. uh, we were learning about the Donner Party. What is the Donner Party? Tell me this. I do not Ooh. know. Uh, Danny knows maybe. Oh yeah, yeah. That's some California lore right there, Belinth. Uh oh. Yeah, I know you're from the East Coast, but oh man, do do you want to hear? Yeah, a brief, absolutely. Brief story. So there were a group of um of settlers. People were migrating from the Eastern United States to California. Uh, this is back in the covered wagon days. And back then, people used to sell these, uh, you know, sometimes charlatans would sell these special guidebooks where it's like, oh, yeah, well, like a snake oil kind of thing, but in written form. Be like, yeah, you can take this shortcut here. I promise it'll shave 10 days off your trip. And so they did that, and they took kind of a shortcut as they were trying to go over the Sierra Nevada mountains into California. And uh, it set them back by quite a ways. They had to, like, turn around, as I recall. They got stuck at Donner Pass was named after the Donner party the Donner family um we're trying to go over and they uh yeah they got stuck there in the snow and uh they like resorted to cannibalism to survive oh wow it's a pretty grim tale yeah so when but, uh, we had someone in chat tell me uh pitbull girl or no uh wager's law you seen hannibal <laughs> that, i, I <laughs> yep uh big brain thank you by the way uh for coming as well something monstrous gifting five tier one subs monstrous the quadro art eq washu exorus kai rinchan 06 and double dribble thank you all so much and pushing us on our hype challenge those of y'all don't know we were invited to the twitch hype challenge of 900 streamers and every sub gifts sub resub bit drives that challenge bar further we hit level eight which means we're going to be bringing science to the front page of twitch which i am super congratulations on that balint that's super exciting holy I, cow this this community right here pushing us and for the raiders by the way we need to introduce ourselves i have a guest on today he's a single greatest science communicator on the platform his name is danny anduza he is tagged in the stream please drop him a follows he will teach you all about every single dinosaur on the planet and more a resident paleontologist <laughs> and <more>. uh, <laughs> no don't let don't let him say, don't let him put down any like suggestion that he's not the best y'all um because he'll try he'll try but he is in fact the best and my oh, name is Belen. Holy cow. uh we're one third of science streams so uh, my wife Lita and i are uh, geneticists we have our phds in molecular biology and we do interact with science streams here on twitch from microscopy to art sci-fi science science news of the week deep dive scientific topics games 3d printing even irl streams tomorrow we're actually doing a an irl stream from a fossil dig site here in new jersey where we'll be uh, very cool panning for more fossils. We have found some shark teeth last time. Uh, That's awesome. Some Cretaceous stuff, right? I think. Uh, yep. Yeah, I think I would not be surprised if that's actually coeval. If it's the same age as the marl pits in New Jersey, uh, a lot of this like marine stuff. Yeah. Did you say you have mosasaur teeth in there sometimes? Yep. Yep. Yeah. And so that's, that's very been nice. A, it's been a lot of fun. So chat uh, for the Raiders coming. We're trying this new. Danny and I were spitballing. We're like, you know, it'd be really fun to have a crossover stream, maybe even yeah. once a week, if 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 I can convince this gentleman right here to put up with me, where we go over scientific Jeez. papers from each other's fields with our own pers- different perspectives. So we're going over a dino paper. Danny's the expert on it. I know I'm I'm used to doing experiments in insects and like doing the genetics of things, right? But all of a sudden, this is a very different kind of experiment and study and so we're trying to go over well, how these things can work and asking each other questions mm-hmm. but also taking questions from chat and just dissecting how science works so y'all welcome the heck in it's great to have you here, everybody thank you for joining us and uh, uh murph thank you for completing the uh the science game night challenge uh that we're, we're uh pushing so we now will have a, a a game night thank you very much for that murph welcome uh welcome the heck in everybody and thank you very much for that uh that contribution to those points. Uh, will there be a VOD? Yes, there is a VOD, Pristine Biscuit. Also, Pristine, please go follow our friend Danny over at Paleontologizing. There's in three minutes, I, I can that. give you the fancy pants shout out because it's once an hour. That belongs in the museum. But there's the old school shout that. out. In three minutes, I can give you all the one with the heart above the screen, but Twitch tells me that I can only do it <laughs> once an hour. Um, uh, I want to do it every minute, chat. I do it every minute. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it. Thank you, boy. <laughs> uh, 
But yeah, so we were uh, talking about teeth structure and how from tooth structure you can influence, you can take into account like what the hunting behavior might be of these animals. And we had already known Tyrannosaurus and its bite marks, mm -hmm. and they have bone crushing teeth. And then these dinosaurs in a different formation of excavation have much different size teeth. Danny actually showed a 3D printed skull and we looked at the tooth structure yeah. and it wasn't as wide. So clearly it was a kind of bite force that is not for crushing bone but rather almost pulling off the meat and occasionally scraping the bone and so this study did a we almost called it a meta-analysis where they went through mu museums mm -hmm. did bone scans to try to find these scratches that were stemming from teeth and this is super cool they actually did a 3d reconstruction uh and scanned it into the paper where they could see what these bite marks were look like so these are like the 3d scans pull up the, the really first cool figure. stuff yeah yeah i really really like these kinds of figures here where you can see like they did the zoom ins and almost like a a scanning electron micrograph almost like but on a digital mm -hmm. scan you can see the imprints of the teeth and what's cool is this isn't just scratch marks like from someone's tool because you can tell that difference and it's actually coming from the teeth and it's like all coming together it's super super yep. cool <laughs> I'm, it's awesome to see you get excited about this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, that's that's the fun part of of science, right? Is we should be able to get excited about these. And by the way, did I summarize yeah, it correctly? You're yeah. the expert professor. Oh please, I, I I don't know. We're all as scientists, we are just like we're detectives trying to figure out how the how the natural world works. And we've got different specialties. We've got different ways of of looking at these different phenomena. And it's cool that we've still got common language there, though. You know, where like we can both get excited about this, we can both appreciate it, even though we come from very different fields of study within science. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Riot Girl, super yeah. tired. No worries at all, Riot Girl. Just thank you for hanging with us. I appreciate you. And Blitz, hello. Yes, Blitz. <laughs> Blob, it's indeed here. Uh, Hugan's wondering. Um, I do have a question for uh -huh. Danny. Uh, why in the okay. in the field guide to dinosaurs does Greg Paul consider Archaeopteryx a dinosaur? <laughs> Oh, because it's got that sickle claw on its second toe, uh, like like Dromaeosaurs and Troodontids. The Thermopolis specimen of Archaeopteryx in Thermopolis, Wyoming, that's got the that second toe claw clearly visible. So we know that Archaeopteryx is a Deinonychosaur. Yeah, I that's really cool. That's that's one of those <laughs> that's, those little details, right? That's even in Jurassic Park of like, well, or I can't remember, but I remember yep. learning about that skeleton right for the archaeopteryx uh -huh. that beautiful image right that's really mm -hmm. well preserved fossil and you saw the little hooks on it on its yeah. feet and you're like that you know as a kid i was like oh that's very raptor like <laughs> here let me let me show you i've got the archaeopteryx right over here um this is the the berlin specimen of archaeopteryx right here which uh -huh. does not have those toe claws clearly visible um, and so for a long time, we didn't realize that Archaeopteryx was a Deinonychosaur, that it's related to Dromaeosaurs and Troodontids. It's related to Velociraptor, pretty close relative. We didn't know that um, until another specimen, not this one, a different one was found. And it was sold to a private buyer, and it's now on display at the Wyoming Dinosaur Center in Thermopolis, Wyoming. That's got the, the sickle toe claw, like on Velociraptor. So anyway... It's it's kind of a recent thing to realize that Archaeopteryx is super close to Velociraptor. Is that yeah. close? Uh, John Ray's asking to the actual size of an Archaeopteryx that that model. It's life size here, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. It, and it wades through it's about a lot. The size of, asking, of a crow. <laughs> is this yeah. the one that the fossil guy showed the kid on how the dino, dino would disembowel him? <laughs> no, that or, was uh, in Jurassic Park. Yeah. yeah. That was just a, a claw from a dromaeosaur. Yeah, that was a six-foot The funny foot thing turkey. is the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, that dinosaur, even though they call it Velociraptor in Jurassic Park, that's not Velociraptor. That's a different dinosaur called Deinonychus. It's kind of a long story why they picked that name instead. But, uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> There's always that, that name. That's the other thing, too, that gets me between our fields is the naming conventions. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. how y'all come up with a new species name, you know, versus, like, you were telling us, like, one pelvic bone could be one or not. And for us, a new gene is uh -huh. essentially 
comes down to something similar where uh -huh. if it's been described in some other organism the expectation is that you take out you you make it a similar name like if i have found a gene in a mouse and now i find it in a fly then it's d for drosophila with the name of the gene huh. from the mouse but if like you, d sonic hedgehog or something like that well so for that one because it was first in fly it's sonic hedgehog uh -huh. regular in fly and then in human, okay. you then have H S S or H S H H. Then you have the indicator after. So it's again that direction. Oh, um, gotcha. But we had a uh, like, there's uh, memory mutants or long-lived mutants, um, short-lived ones like uh, one's called Kenny from South Park. It flies uh -huh. because it dies quickly. <laughs> and then you know that's like you never have that naming convention on other organisms because that's like yeah wait a minute that's not what you're supposed to be calling <laughs> them. Huh. Uh, yeah it's there's there's different rules that like govern what we can call um i would say living th they're once living things they're extinct now but uh yeah there's like there's rules that govern that but we can also get kind of creative sometimes like there have been different dinosaurs that have been named after different people different mythological figures and stuff like that there was a dinosaur recently that was called uh thanos t-h-a-n-o-s after like a comic book character i think really um yeah yeah it's an a belly sword a, a two-legged meat-eating dinosaur from south america huh i think it was based on very little it was like a single vertebra or something crazy like this it's like not very much but they they gave it a you know a catchy name and it's gotten a lot of attention despite how scrappy it is yeah nice uh, we have um the most interesting one i think is uh in flies and based on that is there's a uh, one called methuselah after the biblical figure the longest person yeah, lived individual very old. and that that nice. fly can live like 40 percent longer than the regular mm -hmm. a regular fruit fly and it's not that it ages slower it keeps aging uh -huh. at the same rate. It can just somehow live longer. Huh. And no one uh -huh. still knows like what exactly that mutation does. So what I'm, what I wonder about is what's the difference there? That's what the question that jumps to mind for me. What's the difference between aging more slowly and just aging for a longer amount of time? Like, how do you quantify aging? I guess is my question. So. It depends on it. It gets really murky. I, I guess similar to how uh -huh. like we were talking about the paleontological side of like the teeth. You know, you were saying like what could be murky with like the the yeah. like if the animal's dead or been hunted with the aging. You have to define for your experiment what you're calling aging. Is it cellular aging? Uh -huh. So you can measure that based on like cell death rates and how many cells are present in, in, in the, dreams, the organism. One is not Tommy by sleep well. Limitations. Yeah. What does that mean? Tommy Plotik. <laughs> um, Night time, Platicus. Or so you can look at uh, free radical formation. So that's a common feature of aging, right? Is that okay. they release these reactive oxygen yeah. species, and then they, those cells will die faster. And so actually, so I had a friend who did a study on slower aging, and she was looking at the the reactive oxygen release. Wait, sir. Thank you for the follow, and how. <laughs> you could slow down aging with some mutations that actually will eat up these reactive oxygen species faster. And so then they have huh. cellular aging slower. And then there's physiological aging where you just, you do uh, like behavioral measurements in flies. So you get a vial and you tap uh -huh. it down on the ground. And then you, you have little okay. lines on this vial and you measure after 10 seconds how many individuals have moved past a certain line. <laughs> and so, and yeah, you might be like, this is okay. insane, right? And okay, fair, fair. But en enough times and you get a, a decent like average of what it is. And then, well, so yeah. it turns out young flies can tell gravity uh -huh. and they negative geotax. So they go against gravity. They run up to the surface of what top of whatever you have them in. So you have them in a vial, uh -huh. you keep turning them. They keep running to the top. Uh -huh. And as they age, they stop doing that and so you can accelerate aging a yeah. in a very young fly and it'll stop running up that's pretty cool that's and pretty so cool. I, but again it gets the definitions which is uh yeah makes things tough uh 
And yeah, sure. cellular senescence, John Wright, absolutely something so when cells stop dividing. But it gets mm -hmm. murky too with different organisms. Some have it where, you know, you have constant cell division, different tissues keep dividing, like gut cells, but then like neurons mm -hmm. will stop dividing. And so that's not necessarily not aging, that's just a sign of maturity in the cell. And so then, okay, right, that's another difficulty of that. Um, and soup, welcome in on official oh, soup. Hang on, I gotta. My earbud just died. I gotta plug this in, and let's go to a backup here. There Lady we go. Fiend, welcome in as well. Avengers Thanos. This thing to sync properly. Sync up. Hang on. Sorry, Belen. No, you're fine. Okay, good. I can hear you now. Excellent. Okay, cool. That was on me. I was like, I'm just staying quiet. Oh, what do we do? <laughs> um, Murph yeah. asked if. I'll uh, wait for the other one to charge and. Yeah. I'll have to use this for now. But yeah. Yeah. M Murph was wondering if flies are bound by telomere issues. So that could be an, an, an illustration of aging as well as looking at the telomere length. That, that's uh, one yeah, thing, yeah. too, that you can look at in the length of those telomeres. Um, that is also, Murph, yeah, you do see that in aging animals, is that those do get shortened. And you can actually uh, change certain genes to keep the structure longer. And that doesn't always equate to a longer lifespan, uh, which is, again, interesting. It's like what other there's other factors at play just beyond telomere length that affect the aging. And so it's aging on its own is just such a murky term. And so that's why you always have to in the papers we talk about on aging they define what aging is there's actually danny a, i maybe you'd find this interesting too a paper a few months ago on mm -hmm. looking at how social groups affect aging so they did a huh. they did a study on a meta-analysis on humans and a study on flies where animals were either isolated or housed in groups for the fly experiments uh -huh. and then with the humans it was just an analysis of like lifestyle of individuals that were social or asocial and that's you know with covid they actually could get that kind of data and analyzing quality of life and health and it seemed huh. like that's that study suggests that in group settings you're you have a longer lifespan than you do when you're solitary that makes intuitive sense like knowing people and yeah which yeah, is interesting but, but then that brings into question all other aging experiments that people do right because sometimes in, this, in those sure. like for those flies in like isolation you, yeah you, you like isolate them because you want to make sure they're not yeah. mixing and you can track individuals but now it's like oh no that might actually be this like confounding variable you never accounted for right did they have a mechanism for that proposed for like what what being solitary does to you so it seems like at least in flies it increases stress hormones and so it's just oh, like it's okay. a general stress signaling that happens but mm -hmm. they they went the follow-up paper well i guess preceding paper this was the follow-up because they've shifted a little to humans as well was they gave the flies a disease mm -hmm. actually they gave them colon cancer and that's all by mutating Ooh. one gene uh it's called apc uh -huh. and if you mutate it in a human you also get colon cancer so it's conserved and um if you give them that disease, they start getting these growth of tumors in their gut cells. If uh -huh. they're in groups of individuals, that tumor progression is slower than if they're by themselves. So there's like huh. this extra layer of difficulty, right? Of like interpreting then of disease uh -huh. progression also as a function of being alone or not. And then imagine like if you're in a hospital isolated in a wing, does that actually slow down your chances you know it's it's easy to make those jumps we don't necessarily have the answers right. to them but you want to make those uh -huh. jumps given the conservation of the the genetics and a sarcastic right. ninja asked the question did you all see that study when regular flies are in the city of dead flies they die faster yes huh. uh, so that actually I, I saw that study unpublished years before it came out and so danny the idea is if you have Very two cool. species of the same fly, and they're next to mm -hmm. one another, and they can see each other but not smell each other. So, like, imagine like two containers, clear glass in between them, and you, sure. you you put dead ones on one side and living ones on the other. The living ones have a shortened lifespan when compared to ones 
that aren't next to neighboring dead kin. Interesting. And then where it gets wild, too, I think, is if you do it with a different species, it doesn't uh -huh. have them. They don't have the same effect right. if it's a different species. And it's, and it's just visual. Because they That's don't wild. have to be so in the can, same chamber. The idea is that they can, they've got species recognition at the species level. Um, just visually. Yeah. No smell, nothing else. Right, there's no behavior even to take wow. in with visual. So it's just like there's just this dead animal next to you. And somehow right. the mechanism really wasn't worked out, unfortunately. It was very much like your first pass um, look at the paper, like at the phenomena right. and like, you know, having like you doing doing all the experiments that are convincing that it is visual. Like if you do it with blind flies, it doesn't work. Uh -huh. If you do it with mutants that can't smell it still works so like you know it's still like you're hmm. you're set on it from a genetic side but there wasn't yet a a functional side of how this exactly works interesting well i, I know that in different metazoan animals in um, in elephants they've been recognized to like they can recognize dead members of their own species and like it really freaks them out like when an elephant comes across the skull of another elephant um, that might be more smell than sight because it's a skull. Like they might not recognize that that's part of the body of an elephant. But being able to smell it like that, yeah, um, that's interesting. And it almost it almost kind of gets into this idea of like the inner lives of animals. Maybe this is a good segue actually into that into the rat paper. Perfect. Should we, should we dive into that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, we had a I could see a question. Hi, Casey Snow Art. How do we contribute XP points to the hype challenge to get us to level nine? So, Casey, to Ooh. do that, it is bits, subs, gift subs, resubs, and prime subs. Those all push that bar, and it ends tomorrow nice. night at midnight Pacific. So, 3 a.m. Eastern is the last time uh, to contribute to that hype challenge. And yeah, if we hit level nine, tomorrow night we'll raffle off a pair of brand new Bose Twitch Purple headphones. Ooh. Wow. Holy and cow. Just so you all know, that's something that we would win as the streamer, but we're passing on everything that we would win to the community because y'all are the ones that are supporting us, and that just makes the most amount of sense is that it's back to the community. So we've... Together with the John Ray! We've got raffle off John Ray. Uh, thank you for that sub with Prime, <laughs> with that three-month streak. Thank you very much, John Ray. John Ray underscore 124 just subscribed with Prime. Thank you, John Ray. Uh, yeah, so we raffled off um, a LED sign with someone's name on it. We did uh, Professor Anduza, sir. Thank you for that tier one gift sub to Elwa Lynx. Thank you, Danny. Thank you very much, Danny. Um, uh, you're welcome. See, do you have to uh, 2D? I do not, JD. I do not have um, those characters rigged, unfortunately. I don't know how to do the rigging, JD. But if you want to chat, uh, D Discord DM me and we can talk about that. Uh, but yeah, so that's how we get it. If we get to level nine, we'll do that raffle. There's other raffles as well uh, at higher levels. Um, there's, I think, a $500 Delta travel voucher at 10, a brand new Nintendo Switch at level 11, and at 12, y'all get to get us to do whatever you want for a stream, meaning that uh, not with, within reason, there will not be a hot tub stream. But if you wanted, we can do like a... Hi! Kai, thank you for the five yeah, tier one gift subs, madame. Kai Fish gifting subs to Fun with Brian, Miss K's Pushkash YTP. That's a Hungarian name right there. Alice Amide and Captain Morgan24. Thank you, Kai Fish, for this five tier one gift sub. Y'all did start something. For every level sub we uh, hype chain we complete, we will do a raffle, but we're going to push those raffles to tomorrow night. I want to be respectful of Danny's time. Because uh, I'm sure Danny doesn't want to sit through uh, <laughs> raffles, but we will do them tomorrow night. Everything that I owe y'all, and that means there's two raffles nice. on the menu for tomorrow night. Thank y'all very much. And as the higher we get, the more points. We're near at seventy thousand, so we're at six. We're yeah, we're essentially six nine 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 all the all the way to it, all the way. <laughs> and uh, no nice. sorry, Casey. Thank you for asking. Thank you for asking. John Ray, are you hung Hungarian too, John Ray? Throwing in some Hungarian into the chat. I see you there, John Ray. <laughs> so yeah, the, the next... I, I recognize that that word Magyar is is that 
Is that mean Hungarian? In, yep. Uh, in Hungarian? That's Hungarian. There's a dinosaur. Hungarian, yeah. <laughs> there's a dinosaur called Megyarosaurus that is from uh, from Hungary. What kind? Yeah. It's a, I think it's a dwarf titanosaur. Okay. If I'm remembering the right one, but it's a, it's a big sauropod. Um, except this one, you should look it up real quick. But I'm and pretty sure Magyarosaurus might be the dwarf one, where it lived on a small island, and so they got smaller. And Big Gamey, thank you for the 100 biddies. Big Gamey, how you doing tonight, sir? Is it? Let's see. Oh, so it's. It looks like dimension six meters in length, one and a half yeah. meters in height. It's just a little mini one. Huh. Yeah. So this is an example of what we call insular dwarfism. So like, if you're if your population ends up on a small island, oftentimes, if you're a big animal, you tend to grow smaller. If you're a small animal, you tend to grow bigger. Um, with these guys, they're probably living in an environment where they don't have any big theropod dinosaurs eating them. And so they don't need to get big uh, in order to stay safe. So they can grow smaller because it, it pays to be smaller on a small island. Um, that, that's actually what I was going to ask Food you. resources and stuff. Yeah, ba yeah. Based on what we just so chat, we just talked talked about a paper, and one of the things we were chatting about is dinosaur size and how that might evolve as a function to predict from predation. So if there are no predators, is it there's always a trade off, right? If you get bigger, there's going to be a negative side to that as well. So then maybe that's why they didn't evolve to be bigger if they didn't have anything eating them, which is again yep. a really cool idea. I always love. I don't know how you feel about the idea of trade offs. But I always uh -huh. find the idea of behavioral, Powerful idea, yeah, yeah, physical, molecular yeah. trade-offs really fascinating. Because uh -huh. with these guys, it's it's not just that they didn't grow to be big; it's that they actively grew to be smaller. Like we're sure that their ancestors would have been a lot bigger than than they were. So like it was an advantage to be smaller on those small islands, and so they just got smaller. Um, <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, which is another thing. Uh, they're these really cool giant dormice from I think they're from like the Pliocene of Malta or one of those Mediterranean islands like that um, so you have these giant dormice living on the small island and you have these tiny elephants living on the small island so ancestors of both those you know the elephants and the mice they ended up on this island the elephants shrank over generations the mice got bigger because mice use their small size to hide from predators but if you don't have to do that anymore and you can afford to get bigger. So it's it's really cool how it can have like opposite effects on different groups of creatures living yeah. on a small island like that. Yeah. And uh, Risu, thank you for the one bitty. Thank you, Risu. Y'all have pushed us past <laughs> 700,000 points on that hype challenge. Very we get nice. that last 100,000, uh, someone's getting a pair of Bose headphones. And you know, Danny's just died, so he, <laughs> might, he might want some Twitch purple headphones, Chad. I don't know. <laughs> I've got enough headphones here, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and I saw there was a question. From Together, we can Crux. the galaxy. Crux, thank you for that resub. Nice. It's going to kick in. Uh, Crux he... Gaming just subscribed for five months. It finally worked. Yes, sir. Thank you, Crux, for that resub. I appreciate uh, the heck out of you. Um, Chris says, it might have been that the result of sparse food on the island could have led to the smaller ones surviving perhaps that was the selective pressure that's one of the selective pressures yeah yeah we think um yeah yeah it, it's actually it can be really difficult to try and separate lack of predation from fewer food resources so yeah it's that's a good point it could be really tricky to, to try and separate those things i wonder how you design an experiment to try and differentiate those you know? Yeah, well, especially over yeah. evolutionary time. That's where it gets really difficult, I think. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And y'all, thank you so yeah. much for that hype train. Tomorrow night, we will do the sticker raffles that you are owed for this chew. Uh, so thank y'all very much again for that support and for pushing us over 700,000 uh, points uh, <laughs> right up in the corner. And we're fast approaching a new emote slot, chat. Uh, if we get that 1,800 sub points, we'll have a brand new emote slot. We already unlocked two yeah. this week. Two new emote slots. Holy we cow, gotta that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah, nice. I love my emote slots. We actually are getting, uh, uh, you too, Danny, three new, new animated emotes. slots for tier two and tier three. And nice. I think uh, for regular tier one, also new animated slots as well is also coming. Uh huh. So, Excellent. Yeah. Very, very cool. New slots soon. 
uh, could have been hiding. That's true too, Murph. There, there could, you know, there could be pressures. But as Danny was saying, if there's not really marks on the bone, that could be telling you that maybe there's not predation happening against these animals, and maybe that's why their sizes. Ooh, that'd be really tricky to tell, actually. Um, yeah, saying that there was no predation because we don't find tooth marks, it's we can't, we wouldn't be able to say that with confidence. No, shoot. That's, oh, that's too bad. I thought that could have been, like, tying that other paper together. See, that's, yeah, that's again, the yeah. difficulty of how far can you take the idea presented in uh -huh. one paper and, like, apply it. Because It's I guess really you, difficult like, right, to, like, demonstrate a negative in paleontology. Like, demonstrating a positive is obvious, but, like, demonstrating a negative, like, there was no predation is, that's next to impossible, really. Yeah. So I guess it's almost like the aging field that for us, if you demonstrate something, kill something faster, mm -hmm. that's not necessarily an aging gene. That could be just something that killed it versus yeah. if you demonstrate something that makes it live longer, it's much harder to find, but that's more conclusive. There you go. Yeah. I think it's good. Good analogy. Yeah. Uh, astronomy shows asking if anyone know if, uh, if a Twitch three-hour front page date has been set. Not yet, Astronomy Show. I emailed the Twitch staff this morning, and they'll said they'll let us know what day we'll be on. Hopefully not 4 a.m. on a Sunday. <laughs> uh, I assume they'll, let, they'll give us some dates to choose from, but we're planning on uh, doing maybe some microscopy and live experiments to really excite people about that there's science on the platform. That's our, that's our plan. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, so, yeah, let's jump over to the other paper. Switch on over and out to some imagination. So I sent this to Danny. <laughs> it was paywalled because, you know, that's that's how these work. <laughs> um, I appreciate but, you sending me the actual PDF, though, yeah. Well, yeah, it's... I, I was having a field day trying to find it as well. Um, Mama is a fan. Welcome, and madame, how are you doing today? Uh, so we were able to grab this paper and... Um, essentially is trying to prove that rats have imagination and the way they're doing it is this really neat tricks of imaging neuroscience genetics and uh mathematical predictions i thought it was a really elegantly done paper and i, I was i and was interested in your reaction you were saying like well yeah it's <laughs> you were saying it's almost an <laughs> obvious kind of thing and so i, I think I was just, yeah it, i so I, I'm looking at this from the perspective of a paleontologist, where I'm always thinking about common descent. I'm thinking about different creatures that share the same ancestors. And I've seen dogs, you know, clearly dreaming in their sleep. So like, you know, whimpering or barking and, you know, the eyes go back and forth and their little legs go. And it's like, that's clearly some kind of, you know, that's a dream that they're having, which to me, my mind is tied in with imagination. Um, also, we are not that far from rats in the grand scheme of things. I mean, human beings, we are primates, and primates are closely allied with rodents. We belong to a clade called uh, Eucharonta glyra um, within mammalia, so, like, we're not that far from from critters like, you know, rats and mice and rabbits and stuff like that in the grand scheme of things. So, yeah, it, this kind of reminded me of some of the the studies I've seen before on like animal behavior and cognition and stuff and like I feel like some animal behaviorists are really really reticent to say that animals have things like emotions or thoughts and it's like well why <laughs> um, so like that... oh animals can only have behaviors they can't actually have like inner lives and to that... me as a paleontologist that seems awful weird you know see to, to me the other side seems so weird and that's really that, I, I, yeah so i really i really like this because we are always told like you're yeah just how you kind of said like there is no emotion because it's not human and you can't answer that there is an emotional state so for example like huh. in flies we did this experiment where if you uh incubate them with parasitic wasps uh -huh. they start moving really erratically their sleep pattern changes where they're not sleeping they start laying uh -huh. fewer eggs and start having a lot of behavioral changes to protect their young. And so yeah. someone might, you know, you might consider that as a fear. Sure, but you would probably characterize it as like a stress response, right? Yeah. Just very, very clinical, very detached, very, but 
what would like, you like I don't from, know. from that paleontologist perspective right like how you're saying what would yeah. you define that as then i mean i i think sometimes people are a little bit too even scientists sometimes are a little bit too precious about humans and like oh we're so much different from all other animals but if there's anything we know about the history of life on earth is that we are ourselves you know animals we are derived from earlier primates and so like we're all part of this big happy family of, of animals you know it's trying to say that like we are somehow in a class all of our own or something like that every time anybody's ever tried to say that they've been wrong like the more that we learn about these things the more that we realize that we are you know a different kind of really really cool animal yeah you know i know I, yeah. I love that answer it's just been when it's ingrained in you that you're not supposed to ever Right. You don't yeah, want but, to anthropomorphize. Yeah, critters, and it's, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's always that first step, uh -huh. and it's it all comes down to you can't ask the animal, and so therefore you can't prove sure. that it's it's that. Even if it's like all the cues are pointing, uh -huh. like like you were saying in this study, it's like, of course, like, and I I agree with you. Like, yeah, like you one would predict yeah. that my dog has <laughs> dreams of the cats do too, right? They're uh -huh. wiggling in yeah. their sleep, but the other side it would be that there is then there's no evidence yet to suggest that they are and so then you can't say it which is which is wild to me because it to me it's it's like a question of what your underlying assumption should be like i've i've read stuff from animal animal behaviorists about like chimps and like chimps are our closest well bonobos in particular they used to be called pygmy chimpanzees but uh bonobos and, and chimps are our closest living relatives and i've seen animal behaviorists say like oh we can't really say that they're dreaming or that they're actually upset or something you know they just have stress responses or they have various behaviors and it's like they are super super close to us separated by only about five million years of evolution how in the world can you not make that leap and say that oh yeah they have emotions or they have this or they have that you know and yeah i i kind of wonder whether some of this is like a uh, not to get too severe about this kind of thing, but whether it, it's kind of like a way of of looking at things from a laboratory setting where you have to tell yourself that it's totally okay to keep these animals in a laboratory setting and like you can't think that you're causing bad emotions for them or that you're like mistreating them. So you have to kind of distance yourself and get really clinical and say, oh yeah, well this is a stress response rather than like I'm making this animal sad or angry or something like that. Yeah, I mean, luckily there are regulations in place, right, for yes. taking yeah, care of for sure. what people deem as higher order organisms. It is a debate right. in the field we've had in, on this stream as well. Is, like where you draw that line? Yeah. Well, I mean, and because yeah. like, I always, if I have to dissect a fruit fly larva or an ant, mm -hmm. I'm yeah. dissecting it because I have to for the experiment, not because I think it's funny, right? So it's still there's exactly. that respect for life. Yeah happening yep. and i and i think that's maybe where that that needs to be maybe thresholded is that there is a respect uh -huh. for life still that this animal is still giving its life for an experiment regardless sure. of what kind of organism it is I mean, you're doing this for a you know, like a, a really important purpose because, like we're trying to learn more about the way that nature works and you know like those creatures are not giving their lives in vain i guess that's, exactly that's one way to look at it yeah and yeah, we got a raid. It's important to be respectful of that. We got yeah. a raid from Cosplay Meg. Meg, welcome in. How is your stream tonight, Meg? Guys, if you don't know, Cosplay Meg. Uh, Meg does, uh, as their name suggests, really cool cosplay, as well as they're playing Sea of Thieves. Meg, how is the stream? Tell us all the things. But the raiders coming on in. My name is Belent. One third of science streams, and two thirds are my wife, Lena, and our daughter, Baby Alona. We are research scientists, and we do interactive science streams here on Twitch most days of the week. And tonight we got a special guest, uh, Professor Danny Anduza of Paleontologizing is here. And we're doing a new segment trying to dissect our own pap uh, papers in our fields, but from the perspective, our own unique perspective. So Danny's from a paleontology perspective dissecting this neuroscience paper, and I, from a neuroscience perspective, we're looking at a paleontological paper. And so... Uh, New segment. I think I've been having a blast with it because I keep having all these this questions. Is great, and, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Uh, and Annabella, welcome in too, Annabella. How are you doing, madame? Long time no see. We will give you your fancy pants shout out to the lovely gamer friendo. Annabella is here. Welcome on in, y'all. Meg, we are doing well. The little one is now almost 10 months and she's crawling and Holy standing cow. up. And yeah, she's getting bigger every day. Uh, of course, Meg, <laughs> of course. Thank you for the raid. Uh, they do, yeah, Annabelle. There, she, he, she's getting big so, so fast. Yeah, and, and yeah, Meg. It was in January she was born. Like we are, we're already <laughs> in November. I'm like, where does the time go? <laughs> and uh, Cricket, welcome in, Queen Cricket. How you doing today? Also, welcome on in. Oh my goodness! And for some reason, Murph's comment is uh, flagged by the Automod. No, you're, <laughs> my Murph, you're totally fine. Murph was like, 10 months, I'm so old. And the Automod was like, no, this is hate speech. And uh, <laughs> you're, you're good, Murph. You're good. Uh, but yeah, so uh, we were just getting started on this paper talking about how rats have been shown now to have imagination. And Danny was talking about how, well, yeah. Like we don't necessarily, like, of course they do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> rats aren't that far from us. Like, why would it? It would be more surprising to me if they were just, you know, if their brains worked like a computer or something like that. It's like that's not how brains work, you know. Yeah, yeah although they're, they're mammals just like us. They're you want you are contoglier mammals. They're pretty close to primates, but yeah. Although they did use, I think their use of machines in this was really cool. It really was. I watched some videos about how they actually did this. Um, they, there's actually footage of the the uh, spherical treadmill thing that the rats are on really really neat that was yeah. one of my favorite parts of this yeah so yeah here's the the figure y'all that's that's the yeah. this ball that the rats running on and there's two different types of experiments one when the the rat is running there and it has free range and it can run in any direction and move around and then the second one where it can't run the ball is stable and fixed he can turn but he can't run forward on it and so it's a three-step experiment you know you put them into this arena and they have to find the food and then that arena is recreated in a virtual environment with the ball and then it's still in a virtual environment on the ball but then they need to essentially imagine themselves ahead <laughs> which really I just... really cool way that they, they figured out how to do this like I, yeah just the experimental design was kind of mind-blowing to me that they they figured out how to actually test this idea in a laboratory setting um I, I i didn't completely understand it i'll be totally honest um there are parts of this that i was uh yeah i didn't quite grasp but the idea that they're able to to find a way to actually run an experiment like this very creative I like yeah that a lot. I mean, the the big, I think, pull was, like, the, just the initial setup, right? Like, when they're doing the experiments mm -hmm. in the actual... So, Sarcastic Ninja, like, they're doing the experiments inside, first, of an actual arena. Like, it's not a virtual environment. There's a... You know, there's this setup where they have uh, the water source, there's some opticals, and these mice are dehydrated, right? So, they have a desire to get to a water source, which... Um, there are regulations in place for this. The animals aren't being hurt. This is has to be board approved. So, again, we never would look at a paper, nor would it be published even in the United States, where you're hurting an animal. Uh, and I just want to make that clear because that's again a difference in our fields is, you know, the bones are dead. You know, you can. I mean, scan we try them. not to hurt animals either, but yeah, but ours are usually dead already. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Versus ours, yeah. ours. You know, well, I mean, they will eventually, but. And I think it's super important as well to make sure that the animals are cared for. And like Danny said, like yes. maybe the reason that we say that they're not human or have these feelings is because there is this disconnect that you have to have to be able to work with them. Mm -hmm. And that would make total sense as well. Some would, so I know some folks that don't have that level of awareness. I think they're just like, well, I have to call them for that. Sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they... In this setup, you can put a, a probe and sensor in, onto like the skull of the animal. So you open up the skull, you put on the sensor, and there is a calcium sensor inside of the brain of the animal. When the neurons fire, it shines uh, different lights, essentially. So it looks like this. It's a heat map, essentially, of firing in the animal's brain. And so then, 
what they did was wherever when the animal crossed a particular area, let's say a, a landmark in this maze, a certain set of neurons would fire. And so then they equated with that set of neurons will fire, and that's then that those behave that's the one that's controlling that behavior. And it's a, it felt really cool a little stuff. bit like a stretch to me at the beginning. Yeah. Right, because until I, I until we I don't got... think I even got this far. Where like the, the actual mechanics of how it worked with the, the like machine brain interface, they kind of lost me at that point. I had, I found it difficult to follow. Um, yeah, so that's again a, an be... issue like we talked about yeah. in these papers is like, you know, even though we're both scientists, there's just like gatekeeping on some of these, right? It's, it's because there's this all this background info that's assumed. Yeah, and so and right, that's it's frustrating, and, right? When yeah. it's like. We're supposed to have accessibility uh -huh. to everyone, but then it's not even accessible to other other scientists. It's like, well, who's going to read exactly. this? Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so it's like a, a glass skull. They're shining a light. It's activating the neurons, and they're essentially making a map of what exactly is controlling the behavior of these animals with not not mm -hmm. changing their behavior. It's just their natural behavior, and there's a pattern. And Danny, I want your opinion on this because I have a feeling on this. All the data in okay. the study was based uh -huh. on three animals. Three individual rats yep. for this? I okay. I kind of thought it I almost assumed it was just one. So oh. that's better than <laughs> that's better than maybe I would have. <laughs> yeah, okay. You know, it could could be a lot worse. Could be a lot worse than that. It could have had no rats. So the reason I asked a theoretical is, paper. Well, because because <laughs> in, in in paleontology, like you were telling us, yeah, well, a replicate of one you can actually get a lot of information from, like with the morphology, if you have enough of the structure. Yeah. We but, have to, I, yeah, many times. Like the majority of dinosaurs that have ever been named are based on one single specimen, and usually a very incomplete one. There's a, it might be like. 20% of all dinosaurs that have ever been named are based on like a single bone and um, two of the dinosaur species that you'll see in the, the paper coming up are each based on a single bone too it's a good bone but uh, but yeah we'll get to that in a bit yeah which is like, so to me it was surprising because even in other mouse studies and rat studies it's still like it's a higher replicate number because it's almost like oh, okay. because you can it's, there's an obligation like in flies you're sure. talking 10 replicates at minimum and that's in groups okay. and if they're in individuals you're talking 50 replicates right and so it's uh -huh. just that sense of scale of what we consider as enough data to uh -huh. make a claim i just think is interesting across our different fields like what what sure, counts yeah. as enough data to make that claim i mean you work with what you've got and like fruit flies are not difficult to get so I guess you can have a lot of them. Rats at the same time are not, you know, they're not rare animals and they're not super expensive. To, they're, you know, we're not talking African elephants here or anything. But like their, can... their daily care is $7 a day per animal. Seven dollars? What are rats eating? That's more seven, than I spend on food in some days. Seven zero uh, per day per animal. Wait, 70? Seven zero? Yes. No, not $7. 70. I was gonna say seven dollars is more than I spend on food in a given. Day. I know, I know, uh, but no. And seven D. Yeah. Wow. Per mouse. How do I get this gig? <laughs> yeah. um, I could really a guy like me could really clean up, you know. And uh, and Ariella studies who's here in the chat, so she's a MD PhD researcher. She's got um, uh -huh. C. elegans and nematodes that she works with. So she was saying like, yeah, hundred, yeah. hundred individuals, right? Is standard. Um, uh huh. But it's just, yeah, so it's $70 a day per rat. And then that's, you know, including when they're born. And so uh -huh. when you age match them, any aging experiment in these animals, you can imagine adds up very rapidly. So that's nuts. Yeah. And it, I mean, it, shoot, when we're out in the field digging up new dinosaur species, you're not even going to spend $70 a week feeding like a single volunteer. Um, it's. <laughs> Yeah. I that it's an incredible amount of money. Like my I'm flabbergasted. In part yeah. it's it's the 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 animal facility 
like mm-hmm. the building that because it has to be so controlled and regulated with light cycles. That makes um, sense. The standardized, As it should be. The standardized yeah. food. There is the the animal caretakers' salaries that go into it because usually not the lab. It's like a facility person that does it. Um, there's sure. just so much back end stuff to make sure everything's standardized. I think that's where also the costs are added up. And uh-huh. weirdly enough, security. No, I get that. Yeah, yeah. So, I've made the mistake yeah. uh, back at the the biosciences building on the UC Berkeley campus, University of California Berkeley. Um, when I was in high school, I volunteered there at the Museum of Paleontology in the building. One time, I left my my old rucksack, which is like kind of a dingy looking brown backpack. I left it in front of my my supervisor's door, and like there were alarms and stuff going on because um, <laughs> like sometimes people try and do crazy stuff when there's like a you know a laboratory with animals in the building like yeah yeah my dad there's security concerns for sure well my dad actually had that because he so he was a medical school professor at mercer medical school someone Uh and they they had rats mice um and opossums in fact he he was one of the first people who helped sequence the opossum genome yeah, which are they're now like almost a standard uh, like model organism, aren't they? For can for cancer research, it turns out they're resilient. Yeah, to are more Very resilient cool. to cancer, yeah. which is crazy. But they've got a lower metabolism. That might be part of it. They're also more resistant to rabies. Yeah, um, which is really cool. Yeah, and also yeah. the North American marsupial, right? Like, I mean, come on, that's cool too. Very cool. <laughs> they've got the most teeth of any North American mammal. They've got fifty-two teeth. Which wow. Is awesome. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but someone broke in to the animal uh-huh. facility and they released all yeah. the animals but not uh-huh. outside in Inside, in, uh, in the uh-huh. room and unfortunately because then you don't know what anything is you have to sack all of them yeah so it's not exactly thought through of that yeah yeah I don't know I have got some better suggestions for what people like that could do to help animals but you know, redacted. You yeah. know. <laughs> Casey asked, can you yeah. explain more about the experiment? How it differentiates between problem solving and imagination? No, that's a great question, Casey. So Casey, first part is definitely problem solving, right? The, the rats have gone, mm-hmm. they're going through the maze, you're figuring out what neurons are firing when they're going through the maze, what happens when they get to the goal, which is the water, what neurons turn on. You repeat it a couple of times and you see the same pattern happening. The same neurons are firing at each of these stages. So, okay. That, I think, is 100% problem solving. Uh, Round two, Casey, is you go and add them to this virtual environment. Right? So, you put them on this ball that's suspended with some air. It's over a microscope. So, you can still see, like, measuring the neurons. And then you're placing on a projector the exact same um, map that you're in, like the animals actually had within the, the lab setting. Ariella, it's behind the paywall, but it is on the Discord. Uh, I will give you the Eureka alert, and that has a link to the paper as well, but it also has like the abridged chat of like what exactly is in the paper. And yeah, paywalls, but you know, y'all know. Y'all know my feeling on the paywalls too. Uh, so for this one, Casey, so they put the yeah they put the rat in a VR environment, but it can still run around. So it's not running, a, you know, through the real room, but as it's moving forward, that's moving ahead in the virtual reality, backwards, side to side. And again, you could still argue this is still problem solving. But what they did was they were able to model the neur- neuronal firing in the brain of the animal and how they moved around in this scenario and compare it to when they were actually moving around in the real setup, like the non-virtual. And they found it's the same neurons are firing. So it was predictive where if you saw these neurons firing, they would be at a particular site. So it's like a, that one-to-one to relationship. And then, so the, the final experiment was they disconnected the treadmill. So they, the ball no longer moves in the virtual reality room. They can turn, so it moves and spins in this sense but they can't run on it. And because they can't run on it, they actually, they wouldn't be able to physically move the ball and therefore ahead in the VR room. So the way they moved ahead in the VR room was they had to think, 
they have to think about where they would be. And this is there's where it gets crazy, right? If those so neurons, cool. right, that when they were at a landmark inside the, the arena fired, they would be transported immediately in the VR setting to that landmark. <laughs> so yeah, that that's where it was like I like I'm mentally tracing out the path I need to go to get to the water. And so I, it's it's hard because it does it doesn't really deconvolute memory, right? Because you still need to remember. And one could argue maybe Danny imagination is memory dependent. Hmm. Uh huh. Right. I, I'm. I don't know. There you can you can. Oh, argue. I think that that's what they argue here, isn't it? That that it's within the the hippocampus. Right. Which is. Um. Yeah. Because yeah. if you re you remove the hippocampus, you lose the ability to remember. There was a a patient mm -hmm. uh, J R and that was had a seizure disorder back i think in the 40s and the huh. the gentleman that uh the cast that the molecule caspasin is named after uh, uh -huh. he removed the guy's hippocampus and the seizures went away uh -huh. but so did the guy's memory <laughs> like, like he, he just oh, wow. all the and, and no one knew no one knew right it was the first yeah, time yeah. happening and so actually this uh -huh. jr gentleman is the most scanned brain in history because of that like he had mris up huh. until i think he died maybe in 2000s and uh constant wow. testing yeah. for that long without a hippocampus that's amazing yeah it turned wow. out that he could do short-term memory so uh -huh. if you had him draw certain shape like if you had concentric circles and you had you wanted him to draw within the circles those mm -hmm. fine motor skills that are dependent on short-term memory he could still do but he couldn't huh. tell you why he was doing this exercise that he started 15 minutes ago. Wow. And so I don't know if That's he, wild. you know, his imagination huh. was ever really addressed, but maybe, like, you know, maybe they are just in, intrinsically linked. Uh-huh. Huh. Interesting stuff. And yeah, Casey, you, don't, you can't differentiate if they had seen the room recently before, but the fact that they could control where they are in the map based on what neurons fired... And that jumped them ahead to a particular site. I think that's hmm. a very telltale sign that there is, you know, they're they're like visualizing where to go, and then the it, the magic of imagination kind of goes away, right? With this paper, where it, it just it becomes a very methodical thing, like these set of neurons fire, and that's what gets you to like this flavor uh -huh. of imagination. But I mean, I think that's in short what it is, right? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I would also push back against that idea. I it always kind of irks me when people say that when you explain something, that it robs it of its magic. It's like, no, that's that makes it so much cooler that we can understand it. Like, yeah, why does why does magic have to mean like, oh, I don't know how this works. Like, why can't why can't the magic be, you know, this is the process that undergirds this and. How cool is that? Like, there's so much, I think, wonder in, in understanding that... Science being yeah. real Sorry, magic. Sorry, I don't mean to jump down your throat about that. No, yeah. no, 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 no. Science being real yeah. magic. There you go. I guess yeah. I was yeah. coming from a perspective of that I have an inherent bias of what I deem as what the word imagination means. Hmm. And it almost doesn't feel like it's... It feels non-physical almost to you? It's It's, like, not... This is this feels to me more like I understand the argument of this being a imagination study, but to me imagination uh -huh. is being able to piece something together from something that didn't exist before, right? So like if you're modeling oh. a, a new dinosaur, let's say in a, a software, sure. you're like I want to take features of this thing and this thing and this thing, and you build this like insane uh -huh. dinosaur model, right? Like that uh, to me is like that's the imagination of piecing together things that hadn't been pieced together before. And like it's so, almost a yeah, creative outlet versus a memory yeah. outlet. Okay, I guess when I hear the word imagination, I just think like internal mental visualization, where it's like being able to picture something in your brain. Um, close your eyes and you can see it there. You know, that's when I think of imagination. I think that's that's what leaps to mind for me. I that's think I that's imagine. probably the much better <laughs> definition because it allows more things underneath it. Huh. Right, okay. like it, it, it allows like that that definition allows my definition in it, but my definition uh -huh. doesn't allow your definition in it, right? So I always like the bigger umbrella right. terms. It's just 
you know, like this is like those biases that come in that we have from yeah whatever life experiences that may have been. I guess, or Chris says maybe there's two types of imagination: a passive one that's reliving huh. the memory, and an active one that's using experiences to achieve different results. So, if that is then huh. the the breakdown, then we were looking at passive memory here or passive imagination because mm. it's reliving the memory of the zones versus. Mm-hmm inventing almost a new map okay yeah that's fair that's fair that was just, and i love danny's perspective of saying like you know i'm i'm looking at this being like oh they proved this thing and Danny's like, of course like, this is a real thing we don't need to have the study to prove this yeah it's a real thing <laughs> and it's, just, it's really cool that we do have a study that demonstrates it but it is something that i would have like just assumed i think that like yeah of course they're they're mammals just like this. Of course, they've got some sort of imagination, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so for those coming on in, they actually had the rats solve a, a maze in real life. They then switched them to a VR setup where they could run around in VR. And then the final setup is where they couldn't run around in VR and they had to visualize where they're supposed to be. And when certain neurons fired, that jumped them in that scene in the VR room as they were trying to go go towards the goal. And so that's how they Which were It's really cool that you basically have rats like controlling a VR game using their minds. Yeah. Like that's that's a neat way to think about this. Yeah, and it's like the, the way they got the code too, right? And how well the model works. Because yeah. right, the way they got it, chat, was that when they running the original experiment in the actual maze, they had sensors hooked up, a cal and there's calcium sensors in the neurons of the hippocampus, so when they fire, you see a glow. And so when the rats are moving to a site, you see it glowing in the brain of the animals, and it's like, okay, well, now you can associate, okay, I'm at this point, that means these neurons fire, and that's how they can have the machine mind control VR game, which is, I thought it was really, really cool. Uh, Alex yeah. says, I've had several teachers to not ask me to not ask questions. It didn't work for two months. They started checking the other students for cue cards. I'm so sorry, <laughs> Alex. You ver Alex, you were always, the people were so rude to you. Because I feel like Alex is quite brilliant. And some people are threatened by that brilliance and asking questions. And that's too bad you had to go through that, Alex. I'm sorry. I still don't understand the difference between imagination and memory in this experiment. How do you prove it's not one or the other? Casey, I don't think that you can. I don't think that you can. The reason being is, as Danny was saying, it's in the hippocampus of the brain. And that part of the animal is inherently long-term memory. And so the only thing, like, what you could do is if you figured out recall in the brain of, like, where they were firing, and that's essentially these neurons... If you took some of these neurons that are in this figure here, like let's say this is a map of the brain, you can silence some of those neurons and prevent them from being able to fire. And so you can you can ask then, well, is that imagination from one site to another site? Like if I block, if it's A, B, C, and I block the neurons that get you to site B, can you get from A to C? That might be a, a means to test if it's memory or just imagination, but I feel like you just you can't split them apart because even then, if you're getting to from A to C, you still have to have gone through the maze to begin with to imagine the existing map of how to get there. So I, I feel like it's gonna be really difficult to tease apart because of where the brain is located, like what tissue the brain that you're feeling and that you're analyzing. I don't, Danny, what do you think? I. I don't, your guess is as good as mine on this. I, and I feel like you understood how the, the experiment was structured a lot better than I did. So I, I don't feel like I have anything to contribute. <laughs> well, it's interesting. You can do this in flies as well. So fruit flies oh. have an equivalent in of to a hippocampus. It's called a mushroom body, mm -hmm. because apparently it looks like a mushroom stalk. I don't see it, but I'm I'm told, it looks like I to me it looks like a football goalposts. Like it's this kind of structure, oh, okay. and it's even uh -huh. like the same genes are turned on and off that are in in hippocampi. If you turn them off, they uh -huh. can't remember, and so there, I think it's much easier to ask these questions. But maybe it was a I you know they probably went with rats a because the lab specialized on them, and b I think it's easier to make the argument that a rat has imagination versus a fly. And we talked about that at the beginning. You were like, I'm not sure why there should be this inherent bias. 
towards different yeah. organisms and like why can't something uh -huh. that we clearly have evolutionary lineage to and share 70 percent of our genome with not have uh -huh. features that we have even because if, right. if i proved it like this with a fly i don't see why that's any different than proving it with a rat but there is that bias oh. like we've gotten reviews on papers where it's like well you haven't proved it in a mouse so then is uh -huh. it really relevant oh i see what you mean yeah yeah i mean it, to me it would be a lot more believable in a mouse or a rat than a fruit fly like it's it seems like a much smaller leap like because we're, we're really close to rats in the grand scheme of things like i've been talking about um like we both belong to the same group of placental mammals um but like you've been talking about there's so many different structures that are conserved between fruit flies and mammals like us that yeah I, I would just think it would be i'm trying to imagine this experimental design working for a fruit fly and it it's hard to picture because how do you strap a fruit fly to a treadmill oh you do and... you do really no so this tell this... me tell me this oh, ball, yeah, I want to hear. This ball experiment that uh -huh. we have here with the microscope over, that is standard in a fly. And it is, Really? Yeah, oh yeah. You you take a, a That's copper, really cool. Holy a copper cow. wire and you just uh -huh. glue it to them. And so they can't they can't <laughs> Yeah, no, it's such a disappointment. It's nothing like fancy. It's just you glue a wire to them and it fixes uh -huh. them in place. They, you don't snip their wings because if you did, then you could argue while well, you physically injured the animal. Even they don't bleed if you cut their wings off, but you know they can't sure. do cleaning behavior. It all of a sudden changes things, so it's affixing them. Uh -huh. Or the way to do it is if you you can open up their head cavity and fix a microscope uh -huh. to it and have lasers shining in, and then you can map and see what neurons are also firing on and off while it's running on the treadmill. And a fruit fly in, in Drosophila. Yeah. You you have instruments that are that small and precise? You don't even need like a smaller microscope lens. You can do a, a regular lens to it and a regular laser. It's called a, a two -phot photon microscope for those interested. And you can see the structures. It'll shine in the lights. Yeah. Totally uh -huh. works with it. Um, and so they're, they do, and they even have uh, Dr. Irrefutable. <laughs> Thank you for the follow. Welcome. They have these projection screens the same way they have for a mouse. And so you uh -huh. can you can do that with running with the ball. And then flight studies are actually the opposite, where you take the ball away and you hang them on a string. Not, not a copper string this time, but a regular string. And you can yeah. change the VR projection. And you can see how the fly alters its body position to account for those changes in the VR. That's... I had no idea. I, I figured that like scale would be such a huge pitfall here that like none of these things would work with a with a fruit fly. That's extraordinary. Yeah, wow. I, I think the only scale issue right now would be resolution of what uh -huh. neuron is firing. So like with a fly, you'd maybe get at structural information of like it is in the mushroom body, but like on the res sure. that we're looking at here of like being able to pick out neuronal clusters that's mm -hmm. where you're going to run into difficulty because the mouse neurons or rat neurons are bigger and so you are going to sure. get a little bit yeah. of a better visual look to it so with and and uh -huh. reusability right with the mouse you can affix a glass skull and it can run back into the it's um it's cage but if you've opened up a fly's head and fixed it to a microscope once you take it off that microscope it's you flies open head it's dead right it's not it can't yeah you can't really heal that back up or if you do there's no reopening it right uh -huh. and so that's where huh. the some of the the replication would be like it's, if you wanted to go the step by step with this with a fly the same way you did here you'd be you know that's where you'd be physically unable to do it right yeah and uh casey snowart had a question if the rats here had been reused from other experiments like training paradigms and that that's a great question casey so there's a lot of rats and mice tend to be sacked after doing one experiment with hi zentaus welcome in danny's name is mirrored because he is mirrored zen uh but we wanted to be looking at each other when chatting and not yeah. reverse because and also like 
you know, this is not mirrored. The, <laughs> for whatever reason, Twitch wants to mirror the camera, and but no, this is this is legit. I promise this book is not backwards. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and Doctor Cat is here too. We met at the panel. Doctor Cat had a Lego panel, and then Doc. She also came out to our uh, science panel. Uh, welcome the heck in, y'all. Very nice. So yeah, uh, yeah. there is um, Casey. You continue to re you use new animals for each of these experiments. So unlike with um, chimps, right, where if there's a chimp that's you know you've had and drug tested on multiple different treatments over and over, which you're right. I feel like always to me that could be a variable that isn't accounted for of like what you've tested on this animal before and how that might you know immune memory could be acting at play there. Uh, with the rats and mice, it's a brand new animal. It's never seen it before. Probably its parents haven't seen it either, so there's nothing epigenetic passed on because that's important. That's now something that people are finding as a thing. Uh, Even for an experiment like this, you got to worry about epigenetics, really. So, a wild experiment, Danny. I know we're so rabbit holing uh -huh. here. And my friend, by the way, no, this is when great. you need to go, please let me know because I know uh -huh. you you were streaming at 5 p.m. And so now it's uh -huh. it's twelve thirty a.m. here, and so I just want to make sure that we don't take <laughs> advantage of you. I should I should probably get going within the hour. I'll okay. put it that way. But, but yeah, yeah. Please, d please tell me, like I, because I will keep. Okay. I, I will we'll be. Too I'm excited. having fun. Like I, I wish I had ended my stream two hours earlier so that I could do this for longer. Yeah. And and I know next Thursday is Thanksgiving Day. I know we'll still be streaming, but. We can reschedule. Uh -huh. I would, if you would be so kind as to come back, I'm having a lot of fun. I hope you are too. What if? Yeah, well, let's figure it out. Let's figure okay. it out. Maybe, maybe I'll do it Friday evening or something. Well, no, Friday evening probably doesn't work for you because uh, Lita's usually, usually on. There, usually, right? Lita's here. Yeah, but we, we'll, maybe we'll figure something out as well. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah, because I, I, I don't know. Chat, let us know. I'm, I'm really digging our these different views, and I think it's a lot of fun to dissect these papers from these two different perspectives um and i think it really gives us a a unique way of analyzing the data zin i think Lido would be great to have here too but the spacing is gonna be so hard to yeah with you know everything on screen with three people but we can try you have to green, green screen me into the background or something that's i mean <laughs> you're, you do hard. when you were playing sarian i know you have that green screen that comes down <laughs> But, I so, do have a green screen. I am in possession of a green screen. <laughs> <laughs> with the um, yeah. with the epigenetic side, there was a study a few years ago where if you train a mouse to be afraid of a smell, yeah. and so that's that associative memory, right? You give them an odor and you give uh -huh. them an electric shock, and they eventually learn the odor means pain, so they do this freezing behavior when they just hear the odor independent of the electric shock, and you've, you've trained them in. It turns yeah. out... That next generation, the olfactory bulb where they have that smelling ability is now enlarged and almost mm -hmm. extra sensitive to that odor. Huh. So those next generation F1 that never experienced the electric shock now also uh -huh. ha have this freezing behavior. And not only that, they have a physiological change in their brain of those neurons that detect that odor. Uh huh. That's pretty crazy. Right. Yeah. So you could, wow. if, if those, if you did that fear experiment with those uh, mice and then bred them, and then you looked uh -huh. at the next generation, I mean, you didn't, you weren't testing for this, you might get confounding results. Sure. They might bias your experiment. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. uh, Ariella said she's skeptical wow. of that study uh, and that it was met with a lot of um, pushback and skepticism because it's showing this transgenerational effect across in mammals and that seems to be a uh-huh a, a it, phenomenon it, that is not immediately beloved let's just say uh-huh i mean it is an extraordinary claim like that is really wild um but yeah yeah i don't know i don't this is not my field so i'm not yeah but it, you know if <laughs> if we take it at face value then it tells you uh -huh. like how much like working with living animals there can be effects yeah. that you just can't can't legislate for which I, again mm -hmm. i think it's kind of wild that we have something like that uh but yeah so that's the crux of this paper y'all is there anything danny that you wanted to point out 
you were interested about this one? I thought the videos were really, really neat. I got through most of the paper. They kind of lost me in some of the methods and stuff like that. Um, just because I'm not used to, like, laboratory experiments like this. So I'm guessing that, you know, with your vocabulary and kind of the language within your field, you could probably follow this a lot better than I could. Well, I, um, I think that's that's an interesting point, too, is how do you... Maybe people would be interested in how you read a science paper versus how I, I read one. Like, for me... I usually yeah. don't read. I usually don't read the methods. I tried to, just I often don't either. But like this, I was the methods kind of seem to be critical to the whole paper. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't know. Typically, when I'm reading a paper, I'll go through the abstract first. Maybe I'll skip to discussion and results, and then if that needs more clarification, I might skim through the rest of it, look through the methods and that kind of thing. That's what I did in this case. Um, and I still kind of came away from it not fully understanding it. I think just because a lot of the vocabulary is not stuff that I'm familiar with, because this is so far from my own field. I think the fact, too, that it was published uh, as a science paper is uh -huh. they have such limited text space that it forces oh, yeah. them to yeah, be... Yeah, for sure. It's not even concise at this point, I feel, but it's, it's rather a... Uh, almost a disservice. There's a lot of jargon. Yeah, it's a disservice to the science, I feel. Like, they limit supplement yeah. and text, and it's like, what are you, like, the pixels are going to run out, right? It made sense when it was in print, but yeah. it's, it's not in print, and it's just kind of frustrating. I mean, for me, I always start abstract, and if there's a, a figure summarizing the findings or a mm -hmm. graphical abstract, I run straight to that. Because I, I always, yeah. my brain works on images the best. How, how common are those, by the way, graphical abstracts in your field? Because they're like a brand new thing in paleontology, and I've only seen a few papers with them. It depends on the journal. Uh -huh. And so um, the, uh, we're right now dissecting the idea of how to read a scientific paper, and we're talking about a graphical abstract, which is like the, mm -hmm. the abstract of the paper is just like the one paragraph. Here's the highlights. Here's the big question that we're asking. Here's what we did. Here's what we found. And having an image associated with it, and it seems to be in some journals, it's standard. Others... You see no mention. I always put in our, our papers, I put it as the last figure. I'd have it like, I made up a figure of summarizing, like this is the pathway in terms of like, this gene to this gene to this gene to this gene, and here's how we broke it, and here's what it means. So it's almost like you've got a formula for it, where it's like, that's the typical way that a paper like that will be written. And yeah, that makes a lot of sense that a graphical abstract can plug into that really well. For Although a lot of I will say papers, most people not... don't put that last figure. Uh, oh really? That, yeah, that oh. that was more of a blentism because I would get annoyed okay. when no one would put it, and I had to piece one together yeah. from the paper. It's a cool thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, theory space. Oh, also, Ariella studies up there was saying, uh, "I am so here for hating on these Uber journals. Keep it going. <laughs> I mean, don't get me started on on high impact journals, especially in paleontology and." Yeah. Oh, boy. Anyway, <laughs> continue, Blin. I'm sorry. No, no, no. And, uh, <laughs> theory spaces. I was working on a painting a galaxy on my wall. Very cool theory space. If you have any photos, we'd love to see uh, what you were working on or any Instagram links, anything at all. Please feel free to drop it into the chat. Uh, Ariella says, I just gave a talk at a big conference on Tuesday on science graphics, including graphical and visual abstracts. Nice, Ariella. Very it's, nice. Is the consensus that we're going to have some more? Like, that would be amazing. As I I really like them, <laughs> and it's especially if because the editors work with you and make sure that it's accessible, and it's like it's it's getting the point across. It's not just the authors working on it. Like, they actually pair you with an editor of, like, who will tell you that this is <laughs> no good and you have to do a, a better job illustrating it. Interesting. Huh. Uh, convinced some people Very my talk cool. got good reviews. Very nice, Ariella. I'm not surprised. Nice. I'm not Very surprised. nice. Uh, Ariella, again, yeah. if y'all don't know, is a MD, PhD student and a science artist who's done a lot of even commissioned science work, uh, science art for podcast shows. Uh, so she knows what she's talking about. Uh, Casey nice. says, thank you both for, uh, thank you both guys. Uh, super interesting. You both discuss these topics. So I should stay longer. No worries at all, Casey. Please sleep well. Uh, we will have the VOD up and we're going to do this again, I hope, as long as we haven't scared Danny away. <laughs> No, this is great. Yeah, I just need to end my streams earlier next time. Cause, no. Yeah, this is 
This is excellent. I need yeah. to stop taking so much of your time. <laughs> no, I. It'll be a lot easier, I think, uh, after I move, because I should be able to stream later on Wednesday nights. Cool. And I think that'll be ideal. So if we can make this a Wednesday night thing, perfect. I think that's. I think that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's the study on this one. Do we want to, Danny? Do one more paper tonight i don't want to keep you too long we can you know always say that we'll have be a stopping point we can just like round out some like summaries and move to the next uh -huh. paper is next week again i want to make sure you get dinner and rest and not overexert. i need to get a let's, stream tomorrow let's try well. and speed run these these next two papers okay we'll do one for you and one for me sounds good yeah. which, which one uh there's the we could do the bioluminescence one first or we can do the pachycephalosaur one first whatever you prefer uh, which one's the Paki? Uh, the, let's see. It was something like two new species of Pachycephalosaur. It should be one of the ones I sent you. Oh, this is the Twitter thread one. Oh, yep. Um, Let me grab yeah. it real quick. Yeah, it should be open access. Gotcha. Give me one Or second. if it's not open access, then, well, shoot. It might not be open access. Actually, no, it's not. I couldn't even access this one. Um... <laughs> But we can, we can, it'll, that might be an advantage in speedrunning this. That's yeah. fair. So I should go grab the, the Twitter thread. Yeah. So this is a friend of mine, Kerry Woodruff. We used to dig dinosaurs together in Montana. And he just finished his PhD about a year ago. I think it was last November on pachycephalosaurs. So pachycephalosaurs are these very cool, very thick skulled, they're called dome headed dinosaurs. Um, this is my 3D print of a Pachycephalosaurus skull right here. This is the biggest of the Pachycephalosaurs. But he's got two new species of Pachycephalosaur which mu with much smaller skulls. Um, they would look at something like... Uh, let me grab that. A lot more like this right here. This is the skull of Stegosaurus, which is a smaller... Pachycephalosaur, but they've got these this big skull dome like that, and it's been a mystery for a long time. What is this for? Uh, he's got some other papers coming out about that in the future, but for right now, he's got uh, two new species of these guys, both based on the same bone. We've got it's basically like the rear part of the skull right here, this kind of like shelf that comes off mm -hmm. the back of the dome. Are, are those like they're yeah, these two. And so is the delineating uh -huh. factor then like the shapes that are on there? The shapes and also the stratigraphy too. So these come from different times. And so he is suggesting here that what we have is an anagenetic lineage. So we've got one species basically evolving into another over time, which is oh, really, that's really, really cool. cool. Yeah, and it's, it's awesome that you see highlighted in gray there on the back of the skull you've got the kind of the rear corner mm -hmm. like that um that's a, a really what we call diagnostic part of the animal so the heads of these animals are always evolving and changing like as you go through geological time um probably because it was for display uh but uh yeah so this part is one of the fastest evolving parts of the animal and so if you've got a lineage of them through time then it makes sense that if you find the same part at different stratigraphic horizons they're going to look different because the animals are evolving so that's basically what's going on here do we know why they migrated from like or where they found in one zone versus the other like it looks like on the map there were two different this is probably like an overlapping range so they they probably lived throughout this whole spot right here like mm -hmm. from probably down south to wyoming up through montana and into alberta maybe further north too but we only have two specimens so there's literally one specimen of each of these new species that's oh, it wow yeah and, and so... what's really crazy is the one from montana right there is from the hell creek formation um this is the first scrap that's ever been found of this kind of animal from the hell creek even though we've been working those rocks for like since the 1870s and um they're you... really really well studied so it could just be a really rare animal in that environment that's what i was gonna ask like why do you think that is that it, it yeah. it's not because if we've been digging so long like what about the dig uh -huh. site where it was found is unique like why is there something special about that sometimes you just have animals that are pretty rare in a given environment mm -hmm. so there's just not very many of them to start with 
and when so they're like a living pretty rare that you... yeah yeah okay. um so like if you think about a fossil environment you know if there weren't that many that many animals living there to start with then like the odds of one being preserved as a fossil are really low it could also be misidentification too so pachycephalosaurus is the big pachycephalosaur from this time and place and so it could be that every time somebody's found part of this animal in the past they just slapped that label on it they said oh this is pachycephalosaurus you know didn't think about it any further so there there very well might be bits and pieces of this animal just in museum drawers you know in different museums across the continent and they've just not been identified properly um we see this a lot with different dinosaurs it might yeah. be that it wasn't like this part of the, the skull that was found that where you're seeing that delineating difference oh yeah it like the thing with pachycephalosaurus too is that um their skull is the most diagnostic part, so if you find, like, an arm, or a leg, or a rib, or something, nobody's gonna know it's even a pachycephalosaur. Because nobody's really, like, looked at those in detail. Nobody really pays attention to what we call their postcrania, so all the bones behind the skull. Um, and so, uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, Kerry Woodruff, the guy who, uh, who published this paper, um, that was part of his doctoral thesis is like looking at the post crania of pachycephalosaurs and like he was kind of surprised at how often different parts of pachycephalosaurs have been misidentified as different dinosaurs in the past because nobody really cares about the bones that aren't the skull oh yeah. gotcha so like ribs yeah. arms anything else is just where it's just vertebrae towards something else like in terms of species yeah. versus huh yep because we, really we have cool. so few like dinosaur paleontologists in the world that like nobody's gonna specialize in pachycephalosaur postcrania you know it's not that's not like an attractive part of the end it's not diagnostic it's not going to give you much information so the stuff just gets ignored yeah um yeah and, yeah. and alex says like an an the ankylosaurus skull that was mislabeled as an ankylosaurus but it's actually belonged to a new species of ankylosaurus that happens a lot yeah yeah for sure yeah it's still it's wild to, are you convinced that this is a uh, like based on the data that it's two different species like is this sufficient to you in terms of like the difference in the skull structure i think because i know carrie personally and i know he basically comes from like the same school of thought that i do and we tend to be really careful about naming new species um so if carrie says that it's new uh i'm like just implicitly i want to trust him on that because he wouldn't just go around saying that willy -nilly. yeah um but also he's got some really good data backing it up so like morphologically it's very different so like the ornamentation on it these little bumps this ridge of bumps on there uh is different between these two and that's something that we know uh as these animals are evolving over time like throughout a lineage those are going to be changing so that and also the fact that they're stratigraphically separated so like the one from alberta and canada there that's uh at least a few million years older than the one from montana and so finding those in different horizons like we know that's going to be an evolutionary change there that makes sense i guess that's what's most convincing to me yeah. that that first and then you pair it with the morphological differences because it was just morphology. Yep. And correct me if, if I'm wrong. Morphology if, can lie, yeah, for well, sure. Well, well, just in terms of thinking, right? Like, from the geneticist side of me, is uh -huh. because we only have one sample, what's to say that this isn't a mutant that just sure. had a different ornamentation, yeah. right, than, yep. the, than the regular? A, a mutant, or it could just be, like, different growth stages of the same animal. Uh, changes through ontogeny, as yeah. we would say. Um, yeah. But I, yeah. I think the strata... I mean, I guess it could still be growth stages, right? We're not ruling that out, but the strata would suggest that. Yeah. Well, Kerry actually looked at that too, where I, I'm pretty sure he sampled these histologically. So he actually looked at the growth rings in both of these after cutting them open. And so one of them is a sub-adult and one of them is a juvenile or something like that. But anyway, he was able to control for that variable. Cool. Yeah. And how, how dependable is that in terms of like when you split open a skull and you start looking uh -huh. at like I, yeah. I just from like an experimental like perspective like when you do one slice uh -huh. do, 
do you it's, feel like it's, it's basically the best that we've got okay. for like if you want to figure out a dinosaur's ontogeny you want to figure out how mature it was when it died that's the only really reliable way to do it other people say that you can look at, at like how fused the the vertebral structure is so like are the neural spines fused onto the vertebrae are the skull bones fused up but in my experience those are really poor indicators of maturity okay like you can have a yeah the animal might be mature and like one half of its skull might be fused up and the other half isn't like stuff like that happens it's just not a reliable indicator you got to look at the internal structure of the bone to figure out is the bone was it continuing to grow as the animal died or or it had it stopped growing a long time ago that shows that it's skeletally mature you know nice okay yeah. that's I, I i really like learning about these methodologies because it also uh -huh. to me is demystifying a little bit of how you go through with these experiments yeah because again right like this the the other side of me is like oh yeah like the different the the mutation <laughs> i keep coming back to the genetics right of like seeing and the uh -huh. replicate yeah. number is what drives me crazy but it's really cool to uh -huh. hear that these all there's all these controls here built in it's not just that we have these two samples and we're just looking at them no it's like you're doing the growth rings right. you're doing the the structural information we're trying. yeah and, and the strata yeah. is so there other paleontologists might not might not do that they might not cut the bones open and, and look you know do histo slides and look at the growth rings and everything because they think well morphology is enough morphology doesn't lie and you know the it, it looks different so it must be a new species and i don't know i are you familiar with the idea of like lumpers versus splitters in taxonomy no no okay so this is a thing in in paleontology and i'm sure in other fields too but um like if you if you find two different dinosaur skulls if they're a little bit different from each other like your base assumption as a researcher is your base assumption that they're the same thing or that they're different do you want to lump them together or do you want to split them so are you looking mostly at the differences, or are you looking mostly at the similarities? Mm -hmm. And so nobody ever wants to be labeled as a lumper or a splitter, because it implies that you're biased in one direction or the other, but like, in reality, we're usually one or the other, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm much more on like the lumping side of things, where it's like, you really need to have a high standard of evidence that, that these are different animals, um, you know? Because there's like going to be a lot of individual variation, onto genetic variation, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's like, what are your underlying assumptions? And Carrie, like me, is probably more of a lumper there. Um, and Well, it's like the more conservative yeah. approach, right? Like, before you're ready to label it as a new species, you I mean, uh -huh. a new species, I guess, maybe I, is like an extraordinary can't claim you want extraordinary evidence to back that up that's the problem more. though no is that is that to a splitter it's like well no the much more conservative uh viewpoint is that they're different species really like, what are the odds oh. that you have the same species so like that's the thing is that like the the most parsimonious explanation if you're a lumper is different from the most parsimonious explanation if you're a splitter I like, see. We've got for me, different underlying assumptions. It's a philosophical difference. You know? I see. See, for me, the, yeah. the parsimonious difference is it's going to be the same. Like that's the the most parsimonious way of saying it. That's what I think too. But you've got other paleontologists who are like, well, what are the odds that we'd ever have, you know, two members of the same population preserved? It's like they've got to be separate species because the fossil record is so incomplete and. There's so much species diversity today. What are the odds that you'll get two members of the same species preserved? You know? Does that I make see, sense? Huh. I see that kind yeah. of argument. Yeah. So this is like an eternal problem for paleontologists. Uh, lumpers versus splitters. Like, how do you... How do you think about species differences versus individual differences? Stuff like that. Yeah. I've... Yeah. It's tricky. It's tricky. We have that in genetics as well, I guess, of like how these genes interact and what the likely explanation is. Like, is it like how these genes evolved? Like, is it a, a duplication event? Is it a mutation event? What was the selection pressure? And that also is like, you know, you can look at the genome and see like what the connections are, but then it's it always gets murky when you start talking about like, well, what drove it to duplicate and what was right. the the most common yeah. ancestor like and what did the duplication look like in them versus the modern duplication uh -huh. like there's one in sure. um 
in ant queens where there's two isoforms of a gene so there's one version that's on in all the workers and there's another version that's on in the queen and it seems like the huh. version on in the queen gives it the lifespan of 30 years and that version is off it, it's in the worker it's just not on uh -huh. and so it's like what okay. was i guess the ancestral state did, did, did they have both and both were on it did it evolve during the colony split and it's just like been trying to figure out where that split point happened and what's the most like again I mean, a simple explanation, right, is what we're looking at versus having, yeah. like, extra split points on there. Yeah. I get that, yeah. Yeah, it's it's tricky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I have no answer, right? <laughs> but it, it's, it's super uh -huh. cool. The stuff that we just don't know sometimes, and that's... It could be... You could look at it and be frustrated by it, or you can look at it and go, well, that's... There's so much that we don't have to know, and that's exciting. You know, yeah. So much that we don't know yet, and that's exciting. Yeah. yeah. So this this is really cool to me. I'm I'm really glad that Carrie's got this published because it kind of ties into um this idea that like we're starting to figure out the evolution of dinosaurs in North America through the Cretaceous period, not just like looking them as, as separate species, but like as more of a story through time. It's like we can start to watch some of these creatures evolve and so, so much of this stuff ties together and makes sense. Like, it's a continuous story rather than like, oh yeah, we've got this weird species and that weird species and it's all disconnected. You know, it's it's trying to put it into a grand narrative. And we didn't used to think this sort of thing was possible. We didn't used to think that that the, the dinosaur record was complete enough that we could actually like watch one species evolve into another. But now that we're starting to get more data and we're starting to be more careful about um, correcting for stratigraphy, like looking at, at where these things actually come from and which layers and lining them all up properly, we can start to watch that that pageant of evolution kind of unfold before us. And that's really, really exciting. Yeah, and I still think it's difficult to do, right, with uh, oh, it's very difficult, the, yeah. numbers, the yeah. numbers game that you're, you're up against, right? Especially how you're uh -huh. saying this is the first skull found in the hell's creek formation like after all those hundred like almost 100 over 100 years right of excavating it yeah um yeah. makes it even more difficult but it's a really nice mindset to be able to have if you can start doing these traces yep. because if you mm -hmm. without the traces right i don't like you're not yeah. putting it into a broader context it's just exactly here is this animal and, and and, and one of the things that, that Carrie talks about in that tweet thread, too, is that since these are smaller dinosaurs, it's more likely that, that there being more species there makes sense. So, like, uh, in any given ecosystem, like, you'll have higher species diversity in smaller bodied creatures. So, like, in a given environment, say you've got, like, one square mile of African Serengeti or something like that, you're going to have one species of elephant there. But you might have like six different species of rodents. Um, you might have like five different species of mice in that one environment. Like if you're a smaller animal, um, it's easier to speciate in the first place, like for new species to evolve. But also you can have a much larger population size too. Um, so since these are smaller dinosaurs, it kind of makes sense that that a they could kind of escape undetected until now. But b that you could have like multiple species in the same environment. So with, with this one, um, Spherotholus uh, triregnum there, that's from the Hell Creek Formation. And we already have, just this year, another small pachycephalosaur named from the Hell Creek Formation, Platytholus. So we've got two new pachycephalosaurs from the Hell Creek just published this year. And that's really cool. We think that Platytholus is probably descended from Stegosaurus from this dinosaur. Spherotholus is from a different lineage. It might be related to like Prenocephaly from Mongolia. Um, oh wow! So but like these are two different bridge? dinosaurs that, yeah, yeah. A lot of the dinosaurs we have in the Hell Creek, um, they may have walked over from Asia or vice versa. So like, That's uh, so cool. Trirarchuncus. So like, this dinosaur right here, the you know, my little Alvarisaur from the Hell Creek. This might have evolved from Mononychus in Mongolia. Um, Edmontosaurus, the big duckbill dinosaur, may have evolved from Shantungasaurus, big duckbill from Mongolia, so on and so forth. 
So we know that we've got extremely similar dinosaurs in Mongolia and Montana um, at the end of the Cretaceous period. And that's because because they were walking back and forth, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's there's even, yeah. like, human studies as well of that, like, suggesting that there's, like, the 23andMe, like, full genome sequence or the mitochondrial uh -huh. genome sequencing tracing where lineages have crossed over and, like, what percentage yep. your genome is from, like, different cultures, and that's, like, a similar component of it as well. Yeah. Oh, this is, yeah, really, it's really stuff, cool. Yeah. Uh, and Alex Thanks, said that was, yeah. a, that was yeah. a Kiwisaurus that you had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, looks kind of like a Kiwi bird. I actually modeled the feathers after a Kiwi bird and after an emu. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. That was one of yeah. your models, right, that you were making on stream? Yeah, I sculpted that one and then and then printed it on stream. That's the the dinosaur that I've got my name on the the paper on. Yeah, so I'm one of the authors on that paper, True Rockuncus. Yeah, is that the name means Captain Hook? I mean, I love that. Yeah, was that? Yeah, the because there was one that you were sculpting on. There was a couple you were sculpting on stream. I think for a paper was that that paper that uh -huh. you were doing the sculpting for? No, I did this after the paper just okay. for fun. Yeah. yeah. As a teaching tool, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, no, yeah I the think... other one was was Baryonyx. That's um, that's this critter right here, and I'm still I'm still working on that paper. But I wanted to have like a maquette that I could use for uh for when I do the art for the paper. I actually, have like a physical model that I can light and look at perspective and all that good stuff. So I'm excited yeah. about the the Spinosaurid paper as well. Me too. I really got to get that submitted. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like I want to, I want to hear the findings, uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, holding, holding back. Yeah. Uh, Misadventures yeah, asked, was I there an estimate them. there are a billion T Rexes over their reign? Fossilization may be yeah. rare, but it still leaves a lot of potential, so there'll be plenty of fossils around. Very true, Misadventures and Astro. Yeah, yeah. Some friends of mine actually published that paper from Berkeley, just down the road from me, here in California. Um. Yeah. The. I really wish they had talked a little bit more on, about ontogeny in that paper. Um, but yeah, yeah, there would have been a, a lot of Tyrannosaurus over the lifespan of that species before the asteroid hit. But they were around for like two million years. So um, the idea is that they would have been pretty rare in their environment. But over a long time, there would have been a billion of them that would have lived over, you know, two million years or whatever. But at any, at any given time, there, there may have only been like I don't know, fewer than a thousand of them in North America. Um, so that was really kind of the take home from that paper is like, you would not have a lot of adult T-Rex walking around in North America at any given time. They would probably would have had a pretty huge range. And presumably that's um, a function of diet and how much they would have need to, to survive. Yeah, yeah. What they didn't talk about as much in the paper that I would have really liked to see is just talking about how many young Tyrannosaurus could exist in an environment like that. Um, there's... I think a pitfall that a lot of dinosaur paleontologists fall into is like when you're talking about a dinosaur you're assuming that it's an adult but like dinosaurs did not spend the majority of their time as adults you know the majority of their lifespan and they a lot of them grew a tremendous amount they're doing different ecological jobs at different growth stages they're like moving through different niches as they grow and mature and that sort of thing doesn't get discussed enough like we're used to thinking of mammals today because we're mammals, and mammals occupy the same niche for their whole lives. Like, they're born, they feed on, on milk from their mother until they're old enough to eat what the adults are eating, so they're essentially in the, in the same niche their whole lives. But dinosaurs would have hatched out of an egg, they eat small things when they're small, and they eat progressively larger things as they get bigger and bigger. So they're probably, like, moving through different niches as they grow and mature. And so, like, an ecosystem dominated by by dinosaurs would look totally different from an ecosystem dominated by mammals. Like in a mammalian ecosystem, you could have a lot of different mammals, each doing their own little job because they've each got one niche, but one dinosaur might be hogging 12 different niches over its lifespan. So species diversity for dinosaurs in a given environment might be really low. Um, that's what we seem to see in the Hell Creek. There's like one big meat-eating dinosaur. It's T-Rex. And that's it. Um, but it's because T-Rex is... You know, they're when they're little, they're eating small prey. They get bigger, they're eating slightly larger prey, and so on and so forth. So there's not a lot of room for different species. It's like T-Rex is hogging all those niches. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
And it's... Yeah. I think that's a really nice argument to suggest when you... You know, you were, you've been t you told us in the past that there's been mischaracterization of a species because of size. Like, it's not a oh, yeah. different species, but just a different stage juvenile. But it, uh -huh. but like, I, I like how you're, you're framing it. Like, if if truly, like, in the Hell's Creek, there's only these T-Rexes, and that's because they're in these ecological niches, and they're, like, as they're aging up, they're eating different animals. It's just, uh -huh. that's one way to identify it's one species. It's just, I guess, how do you tie those skeptics... The, lo the, the splitters. It's tricky. The splitters away, yeah. right? That aren't trying to... To move them and say, well, this is actually a smaller meeting dinosaur that was here at this time. Yep. And then, I yeah. mean, you could counter with, like, well, then where's the juvenile T Rexes? But, like, right, how uh -huh. do you pull that together? Yeah. Well, Alex Vixen just pointed this out. So, with Tyrannosaurus in particular, the one that people say, uh, some people say is like a different genus or species is Nano Tyrannus. It's like a Tyrannosaurus, but smaller. Um, and some people say that, oh, it's got a different number of teeth than T-Rex. Um, its arms are larger, or sm I've also heard its arms are smaller. Um, yeah, and it, it's tricky. Like, so far, it seems like all of the nano nanotyrannus specimens are juveniles. Now, if we had a nanotyrannus that it's clear from its, its internal bone structure that it's mature, it'd be like, okay, well, that is a different dinosaur then. It's half the size of T-Rex, but it's full-grown. That's a different dinosaur. But we don't have that yet for Nano Tyrannus. Um, nobody's got uh, what we call an EFS, the external fundamental signature, mm -hmm. which is like the the final rings of like really compact bone. As you as you're done growing, it's like the growth rings get closer and closer together until they're just like smushed. So, um, that's called so the EFS. Nano Tyrannus. We don't, we don't have just, that for Nano Tyrannus. It's just broad, right? It's like a like bigger range than ring bones. Yeah, seems like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, but and but it gets even more complicated, Belen, when you consider stratigraphy too, because like maybe you find a a like a a half sized tyrannosaur, and it's got really big beefy arms. And you could say, well, it's got beefier arms than a than a T Rex, so it must be it's new. It's that's Nano Tyrannus. Like, well, but where does it come from in section? Because if T. Rex, as it's uh, grow, like as it's evolving over millions of years, if it starts out with larger arms and then it continues to evolve and the arms get smaller and smaller, which we think is the case, then well, shoot, maybe that one that you found with big arms, maybe that's just from pretty early in the sequence. It's before those arms evolve to get smaller toward the end of the Hell Creek formation. Well, but then it also gets into the argument of what's a species. <laughs> right exactly like, yeah like, and then at what we don't point? even like we can't even talk about that yet like biological species concepts and stuff because like we're not even on that level we don't even have <sighs> yeah yeah it, is this something that you talk about in in uh, species concepts in your line of work too it's all the time right and it's one of those where yeah so right there's the biological species where if you mate and you produce a progeny that's sterile then you yeah. have two separate species but Danny, uh -huh. what if I what if I put in a mutation that makes the uh -huh. progeny viable? Which we I actually did in grad school. We put in a mutation that was for um, chromosome wow. pairing, and it made the chromosome because uh -huh. apparently that's one of the reasons why those hybrids don't work is because the centromeres with the chromosomes don't pair. Yeah, yeah. But we introduced the uh -huh. mutation that made them pair tighter, so it forced them to interact, and then you got uh -huh. progeny that could now lay. And they were fertile yeah. F1s. Now, did I just create a new species in the lab? Because by the definition... <laughs> that's, that's a good question. I mean, I think I think we as, as scientists in the life sciences need to remember that species are on some level an artificial concept. Like, it's us trying to put boxes around living things that are, like, squishy. And there's all kinds of gray areas and gradients and all kinds of stuff like that. And... We use these shortcuts like the word species to, to help simplify things, to be able to talk more easily about them, to be able to communicate ideas, but like nature doesn't work like that, you know? It, there's going to be weird gray areas that don't fit into those boxes. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, I mean, even or even like uh, the growler, right? Grizzly bears and polar uh -huh. bears. 
those oh, are yeah, genetic yeah. Yeah. mutations. The they have totally viable uh-huh. offspring. And then it's the geologic. Well, yeah. you'd be like, well, it's geolog- you know, physical, geographical separation. And now they're coming yep. together in geography. So then maybe it's not actually like, uh, yep, it's. But it gets even more complicated when you consider time. So, like, modern biologists, they don't have to deal with time because everything lives in the present that you're working with. They're all living animals. But think about, like, uh, you know, like these guys, these pachycephalosaurs. They're evolving over time. And so if you look at them for, like, two million years, if it's one population that's just slowly evolving over time, you've got anagenesis, like non-branching evolution. Just one population evolving through time. At what point do you call it a new species? Like, you can't test if this one from two million years earlier could mount, mate with the one from two million years later, because they never would have met. So, like, the biological species concept kind of falls apart. They can't produce viable offspring because they didn't live at the same time. But, like, um, at what point do you call it a different species? And so... We have this concept uh, called chrono species, where it's like, well, they look different enough, even though it's probably the same population, it's probably the same genes over time. Uh, we're just gonna call them different because they look different, you know? It's not something that like modern species concepts can even really grapple with because because they don't deal with time, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the closest I've been is, uh, in undergrad, it was looking at the phylo- on a phylogeny of 26 fly species where the origin uh-huh. of certain of a, this particular immune response evolved and we actually were able uh-huh. to pinpoint it because it was like on, based on the branching pattern like it's seen here and above and then not here and below uh-huh. but then there were some had strain variations right that they had from different locations mm-hmm. of the world that were still like, called the same species but then they sure. have very different immune responses, and so it's almost there's there is that element of divergence as well, uh-huh. and how you account for that, right? Is like they can still mate, but there's so much fundamental difference in their biology. Right. So at like what point, right? Because then again, there's geographical dif- dif- distances. Yep. So they wouldn't ever mate, and it's, yep. it gets murky. And just with the fossils too, like when we're talking about the amber specimens, like. There's a there's a forty million year gap there of like the hell ant, and why it uh-huh. went extinct. Right. Be- because like you're saying here, like these locations are just sites of good fossils, and we don't have that in the insects, and because it they you know really the resin yep. is the best way to preserve them, and then there's just locational differences and issues with that, and how do you fill those voids? And yep, it's like you're looking through this tiny little keyhole. To try and figure out what's going on in this ecosystem and like or maybe you're looking through holes in a fence um just trying to see what's in the yard there and you know you look really hard through certain holes because it's there and like other places you just have no idea what's going on on the other side until you find another hole and yeah yeah i would argue that's in our genetics too right because you're yeah. only looking at this one question and it's uh-huh. you, it's impossible to ask that question in the scheme of the entire genome of how, how everything else is regulating each other. Oh, right, because it's it's huh. you're hyper focused on this one phenomena, versus how if I mess up this one gene, how the rest of the network breaks, isn't necessarily right. so you're not getting the whole picture. So I think if I any takeaway tonight, it should be that our fields actually aren't so different. <laughs> is that <laughs> right? I like like that. the yeah. kind of the pitfalls you and I have highlighted. Uh-huh. end up being similar for sure yeah dealing with limited information doing the best you can with that yeah so yeah. i i don't know I, I i just i think it's super cool that uh <laughs> you know we it's it's that realization of it of like making these connections and yeah i'm again i keep saying i'm having such a fun time chatting about this it's a lot of i am too holy cow yeah although I really need to make myself some dinner at some point. So maybe this is a good place to end this for now. And yes. Does that, does that work for you? That it, sir, I could have had you for five minutes and that would have been amazing. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that, Belen. This has been a ton of fun. I'm really looking forward to, to doing this again soon. I want this to be a regular thing. Yes, uh, so, absolutely. Folks, yeah. if you're not following Danny F. Paleontologizing, please hit that heart button now above the screen. Where the heck have you been? He's the pioneer of science <laughs> on Twitch, on the internet, everywhere. 
please go follow him. And seriously, if you have a Prime sub, go support this man. It's free, free to you. And he does this full time, and he's an inspiration to all of us here on Science Switch. And thank you for everything you do, Danny. Thank, thank you, Belen. This has been an honor sharing your stream with you. Thank you for this. And uh, let's do this again sometime soon. Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm like, whenever you tell me, I'm like, yes, let's go. <laughs> all right. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, how do we end this thing? Let's see. Oh, I, I will. A red button. Yes, yeah, sir. Have a good night, Danny. You too, Belen. Thank you very much. Uh, see you later.